Welcome to the International Forum on Education, Employment and Training in Tourism. This forum will take place in the context of the Portuguese Presidency of the Council of the European Union, aiming to be a space for information, sharing and debate on the strategic challenges that member states are facing regarding education and training for the tourism sector, key for the future of tourism professionals. Our goal is to promote a transition to go digital, sustainable, and achieve social equity and economic development. Good morning. My name is Pedro Cisa Vieira, and I'm uh, talking to you as a member of the Portuguese government and the minister in charge for tourism. I am talking to you from the within the walls of my home. I am myself in confinement, having tested positive for COVID-19 very recently. And I have been reflecting on our shared experience this last year. As the pandemic has impacted on the way we live, on our societies, our economies, and the way we look into uh, what makes us a uh, polity and a community, we have been also reflecting about what we miss most. And certainly, these last few days, I've been reflecting upon large spaces, upon going to a terrace and having an espresso, uh, uh, taking advantage of the sun and looking at passersby. I am hoping to travel again, to go to beaches, to visit museums, to have these shared experience, which are one of the most precious parts of our lives and which makes us European citizens also uh, feeling that we are part of something larger than our city and our country. As we reflect on these things that we miss, we also reflect on the future. And we're very much looking forward to the time when we will start to travel again, the time when we will start to be tourists again. And certainly, we will start by being tourists in the nearest, in the nearest destinations. Certainly, tourism will come back and will come back strongly once the restrictions uh, have been lifted. These restrictions have most to do with the sanitary situation, the health situation, which requires us to make sure that we are not able to uh, pass the disease to others. These have determined decisions by government to limit traveling, to require uh, quarantines after uh, displacements, to make sure that a number of activities which are face-to-face -face and crucial to the tourism activity have, uh, are not being uh, undertaken. But these things too shall pass. The truth is that we are now facing a more hopeful future, now that vaccination plans are in force and that vaccines are being deployed more and more in the coming months. So we can look forward to a moment when tourism will be back and we will also be traveling further. Now, tourism will not be back just as it was. As we reflect on the future of our societies and our economies, as we start to prepare the deployment of the European funds within next generation EU, uh, we are also considering how best to prepare our societies, our economies for the challenges of tomorrow. The society and the economy of tomorrow will be more digital, more sustainable, and certainly more resilient. We want to make sure that the whole of the human experience is consistent with the goal of preserving the environment in our planet, to make sure that it continues to be the house of mankind 
and all, and all uh, species. But we are also trying to make sure that uh, we take full advantage of digital technologies, which will be critical in terms of the leisure activities and the tourism activity. How we select destinations, how we purchase, how we pay, how we get information about the destinations we are finding ourselves at, how we are managing our companies, how we're taking advantage of the information we have of best about our clients to provide better service, how we manage uh, income and operations, how we connect with suppliers, how we connect with uh, other uh, activities which make part of the value chain. All these topics will be critical to an activity which is so significant in the uh, European economy. Europe is the largest tourist destination and a significant part of our human resources are employed directly on, or indirectly in the tourism activity. So, as tourism becomes more and more important to the European economy, it is appropriate that the Portuguese uh, European presidency takes attention into uh, the tourism activity. How we start again uh, our, and uh, reboot our uh, activity, which has been so much been impacted by this pandemic. But we are also trying to make sure that the level of uh, investment that we allocate to the skills of uh, the uh, human resources employed in the sector are uh, up to date in respect of the critical uh, skills which will be required to the future of this activity. The human uh, resources which are skilled in the uh, digital technologies, both in terms as using them in the day-to-day -day of their activities or preparing the infrastructure which will be required to have more competitive, resilient and sustainable activities will be critical. Which is why we have uh, find, found it useful that in the context of this presidency, we hold this forum about the intricate and inevitable connection between training, education, and the industry. I hope we will have a very fine work this today, and I wish you all a very good 2021. Take care and good health. We will now listen to a message by the European Commissioner for the European Union Single Market, Monsieur Thierry Breton. I would like to thank uh, the Portuguese presidency for organizing this forum. Europe is home to a vibrant tourism ecosystem. Since uh, the onset of the pandemic, this has changed. The entire ecosystem the businesses and the people working in tourism suffer profoundly. Absorbing the economic impact of the pandemic will be not an easy task. Together with the Member States, we are working to bring relief, balancing public health concerns and protecting businesses and jobs. At the same time, we should not lose sight of uh, the long-term perspective and how to build a more resilient tourism. Today's discussion is therefore very timely. We need a double goal. Act in the short term and push long-term investments for the much needed transformation of tourism along a green and digital path. We have the means at the hand. Next generation EU, our recovery instruments, and of course, the future EU budget 21-27 will both help European tourism industry emerge more resilient from the current crisis. So I invited member states to use these unique opportunities. The European Tourism Convention, which uh, I hosted last October, presented a set of actions paving the way towards a European agenda for 2050. 
These include, for example, the need for harmonizing safety protocols, need for data sharing or opportunities to innovate for greener holidays. To support an inclusive recovery, the Commission launched the EU Pact for Skills. Last October, I hosted together with Commissioner Schmidt a roundtable with tourism stakeholders to discuss the best approach for war. Everyone agreed that the crisis can act as an accelerator in the transformation of the tourist sector. Another main outcome was the, that the industry, public authorities, social partners, education and training providers should join forces. They are encouraged to uh, pool expertise, resources and uh, funding towards concrete up and reskilling actions, while the Commission will contribute as networking, knowledge and guidance hub. The task is immense. Around 17 million jobs and uh, the prosperity of more than 2 million businesses are at stake in a sector that is part of uh, the European way of life. The Commission stands ready to support these efforts. Together we can build the tourism of tomorrow we all want for Europe and its people. So I would like to wish you today a very fruitful debate. Thank you. Portuguese Deputy Minister of Labour and Vocational Training, Mr. Miguel Cabrita, will now share his views. Good morning to you all. Um, tourism plays an important role in the European Union. Millions of jobs, a significant percentage of business sector jobs, significant shares of turnover and value added of the non-financial business economy. For small and open economies like Portugal, it plays an even more important role. When we look at tourism figures today, we see them under a different light, as in many sectors. Tourism was one of the first and most severely hit industries based by the coronavirus pandemic. Millions of jobs were endangered, even with the cushion provided by short-term support measures. We cannot avoid to wonder when exactly and under which conditions we will get out of this very difficult period. But for this exact reason, maybe now more than ever, we cannot afford to lose sight of the structural challenges if we want to build resilience and to create conditions to engage in a sustainable recovery path. This surely applies to tourism. We need to look at employment quality and at workers' skills in the sector in an integrated manner. In fact, if tourism matters for employment, employment in tourism matters. Its dynamism matters, its weight in the economy matters, its quality and standards matter. And its sustainability also matters for the future, not only for tourism itself, but for all of us, for our societies and economies as a whole. When we look at tourism today, some still think of labour-intensive activities with relatively low demands in terms of training and qualification. But this is increasingly far from reality on the ground. Tourism is increasingly demanding and competitive. Qualification and skills are more and more important to the quality of services, to build sustainable business models and to improve the capacity to compete in global markets. The attractiveness of destinations, the satisfaction of customers do depend increasingly not on external factors but on service itself and its quality. And this depends increasingly more, to put it simply, on people. Highly skilled, trained, qualified workers in all positions, business leaders, managers, skilled, prepared and motivated workers and teams in the front office but in the back office as well. This trend has deep implications and sets a very high bar for employment in all its dimensions, but for training and skills in the sector as well. This is, of course, not exclusive to tourism, but a cross-cut trend in labour markets. Profound changes in the world of work require a swift adaptation of skills, require strong and modernised education and training systems, especially in vocational and education training systems, and also an increased participation of works, workers and employers. The tourism industry is no exception concerning this. Plus, as in every sector, 
the so-called future of work is ever more present. New business models, global interconnections, digital markets, changing customers' preferences required new and improved skills. For all these reasons, macro tens of digital and green transition, together with short-term challenges, reinforce the importance of skills, vocational training and qualification as essential elements of the sustainability of jobs, of jobs and workers' employers' employability, as well as decisive conditions for competitiveness in the sector. On the other hand, the involvement of all relevant stakeholders, including not only public authorities but also social partners and civil society, is key to the success and efficiency of investment in skills, lifelong learning and qualification in all areas and again, certainly in tourism, given the specific features and challenges of the sector. Thus, it is important to create platforms of permanent dialogue between policymakers and stakeholders, at national level, but also at the European level, for short-term needs and trends, but also for the long term. Ladies and gentlemen, this crisis also highlighted the fragility of employment, special especially precarious employment, and with it the fragility of business models that are based on unstable employment relations. In Portugal, as in many countries, a significant part of the employment losses that followed the pandemic shock were among temporary employees, not only in tourism, but globally in the economy. This proves that this crisis is far from being symmetric. This is a reminder for all of us Tackling, tackling labour market segmentation is also a key priority to increase resilience in the face of economic downturns. This has links with human capital and investment in skills. Workers with temporary contracts have lower access to on-job training, fewer opportunities to accumulate skills and human capital, and compromise, compromises their prospects for professional development. This harms individuals, of course, but it also harms the business models and firms' sustainability and human capital. Therefore, promoting adequate employment standards and reducing labour market segmentation is a key structural element to promote the sustainability of different economic activities and also to achieve progress in education and training. This is why promoting decent work and improving qualifications are among the top priorities of the Portuguese authorities and building resilience in the tourism industry is at the intersection of these two dimensions. We must be committed with investing in upskilling and reskilling in this sector in the best interest of us all as a priority for the future. Dear friends, to conclude, the reflection on employment and skills is key to face our structural challenges present and future, short and medium to long term. This is why the promotion of employment growth, decent work and the future of work are among the top priorities of the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union and why also new skills and innovation will also be a key component of the European Social Summit scheduled for May. Make no mistake, because especially at present we cannot afford to make mistakes or waste any time. Recovery in the tourism sector will only be strong and resilient and sustainable if we invest both in skills and in employment quality. I wish you a day of fruitful debates. It is now time, time to listen to Mr. Zurab Paulo Li Kashvili, Secretary General of the World Tourism Organization. Bom dia, Your Excellency Pedro Cisa Vieira, Minister of Economy. Your Excellency, Ms. Rita Marquez, Secretary of State for Tourism. Distinguished guests, I send my warm greetings to everyone taking part in the International Forum on Education, Employment and Training in Tourism. I would like to thank Minister Cesar Vieira and Secretary of State for Tourism, dear Rita Marquez, for inviting me on this important forum, which comes at a crucial time for our sector. I also take this opportunity to wish Portugal success as President of the Council of the European Union. At UNWTO, education and training for tourism is one of our key priorities. To support growth and to make tourism more competitive and sustainable, we need to invest in our sector's biggest asset, people. Through education, we can build a tourism workforce that meets both current and future demands. This is especially important as we work to restart tourism. The pandemic has 
had a huge impact on the sector. International tourism is back to the levels of 30 years ago and between 100 and 120 million direct tourism jobs are at risk. Tourism education can unlock opportunities for many, especially for those who otherwise would be left behind. I would like to commend Portugal for taking the initiative and the lead here. This forum shows the commitment of desti destinations to develop the abilities of tourism professionals as well as to share knowledge and tools. It shows tourism is ready to meet the new reality. It is important that we stand together during these difficult times. We are stronger together. Once again, I congratulate you for taking the lead in this important topic. Thank you and I wish you all a productive day. Obrigado. The opening session is now complete and we will promptly start our first panel. Under the title, Education and Training in Tourism, How? With an intervention by our keynote speaker, Mr. Carlos Moedas, member of the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation Administration Board and former European Commissioner for Research, Science and Innovation. The panel will be conducted by our moderator, Ms. Mariana Barbosa. Hello and welcome to this international forum on, on education, employment and training in tourism, an initiative that is part of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union. I'm Mariana Barbosa and I'll be your host and your moderator on these discussion panels. Today we're going to have two roundtables and we're going to talk about the present and the future of tourism. This is our invitation to you. So, with no further ado, I would like to introduce our, our very first guest. Please welcome Carlos Moedas, Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation Administration Board Member. Uh, and uh, good morning, Mariana. Good morning to all of you. Uh, all my best wishes uh, to uh, Minister Cesar Vieira um, and uh, a speedy recovery. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I've um, been in so many of these events over the years as a commissioner, and I think uh, that the presidencies are really one of the most important instruments of the European Union as a whole. Uh, so all the best wishes for the Portuguese presidency. And thank you very much for inviting me, especially for this moment. I've talked before uh, uh, in events around tourism, even if my responsibility was not about tourism at the European Commission. And I think that people sometimes don't realize the importance of your industry uh, in Europe. The fact that um, before the pandemic, uh, we expected to create more than 5 million jobs in the tourism industry in the next 10 years. And I think that people don't realize um, the 10% of GDP of the European Union that depend on you directly. And so uh, most of the conferences that one goes talk exactly about the fact that you have a huge economic impact. And I think when you talk about education in training, when you talk about what you will do, I think we should uh, focus also beyond the numbers. And one day in one of uh, the conferences that I was uh, in the European Union, I heard uh, Mr. Taleb Rifai. Uh, he was at the World Tourism Organization. And paraphrasing Kennedy, he said something like that. We should not only discuss what we can do for the tourism industry, but what the tourism industry can do to change the world for better. And I think that the tourism industry has already changed the world for better and that you will play a very important role in the years to come. And why and how? Uh, first, you are and you will be an engine for innovation, which is the engine of prosperity and well-being for people. You can also be an engine for sustainability and the change of the economic paradigm that we've lived until now. And third, you are, and I hope you will be, also an amazing instrument for diplomacy and peace. But let's start with innovation. Um, I think that uh, everybody knows somehow that your industry was much better than other industries. 
you integrated the digital world much faster than other industries that we know. But probably what people don't know is that you had an amazing role in helping other industries understanding that the center of innovation is the product uh, sometimes, but most of the times is the client. That the center of innovation can be the service, but more than a service is the experience. And uh, everybody remembers the big um, quote from the creator of the REITs when he said the client is never wrong. And I think in innovation, we can say that the user is never wrong. Secondly, I think that your industry understood before others that innovation is not only about technology. Innovation is not the invention, is the ability to transform processes, is the ability to have design and marketing on the top of a product to create that experience that is the base for changing the life of people. Uh, a lot of you must know the story uh, of that hotel manager 50 years ago that one day in the morning he had not enough employees to serve the breakfast and he basically in a whole moment, an inspiration moment, decided to put the breakfast on a table at the center of the dining room. And that was that inspiration that created what we call today the buffet breakfast, at least is what the story tells us. So that ability of your industry is really on the top of what innovation is. And so you should be a leader on that change for innovation and a better world. Second, sustainability. I think that tourism has an amazing opportunity to be the leader uh, on the uh, development goals of the United Nations, to become the engine of sustainability. And one day I heard Richard Branson talking about the famous Juan Tripe, the CEO of Pan Am, that in 1945 decided to change the aviation industry by putting a touristic class in the flights from New York to London. And with that, one trip, it changed your industry. He created tourism as you know it today because of that touristic class in aviation. So in the same way that aviation changed your industry, I think that uh, your industry can change and should change aviation in the next years to come. Two years ago, the minister of Norway, um, we met and he took a flight on an electric plane around Oslo. And when he got out of that plane, that plane is called the Alpha Electro, he got off the plane and he said, by 2040, all the domestic flights in Norway should be electric. My friend Bertrand Picard, that had the dream to go around the world flying on an electric plane, he did it. He went around the world with an electric plane. And that is the change that your industry, because people would like to travel, but they want to be sustainable. So the next generation will put pressure for that change. And so this is just one example of the pressure that we'll put on to change the whole industries that are around tourism and that you would have to be the leader of that change. And finally, I think that you are an amazing instrument for peace and for diplomacy not only on a public dimension, but also on a private dimension. On a public dimension, and there's a very, uh, I mean, there's a couple of studies that uh, I read before when I was a commissioner showing that countries that have more tourism are more open. That countries that have more tourism are more open-minded and open to foreigners, open to people coming to their countries. That's normal. It's part of that. But more than that, if you read about conflicts, if you read about the conflict of Kashmir, I think that the industry of tourism played an amazing role because it was that industry that put pressure on the governments to avoid conflict. Because your industry doesn't want to have military conflicts. That was the case of Kashmir, that was the case of Panama, when one needed to demilitarize Panama. It was the role of the touristic industry that put pressure on governments. But more uh, in a private dimension, what can we say? I mean, we could paraphrase Mark Twain when he said that traveling is fatal for prejudice, intolerance and narrow mindedness. Broad views, healthy views, open-minded views cannot be acquired staying in our corner of the world all our lives. 
So tourism is doing an amazing role today in these forefronts. And I think that more than talking about um, what you can do to really put your industry uh, making more money that you need, of course, after this pandemic, I think that is also a good moment because we're suffering this pandemic to rethink in your industry in a different way, to rethink your industry as a leader of change. And then the market share will come and then the world will be with you. Because if not, I mean, you will have a new generation of kids that will avoid flying because they're polluting the environment. They don't want to do that. You will have a new generation of kids that will ask to your industry what you're doing for changing the circular to a circular an economy from a linear economy. So these are the, the things that when you talk about training, when you talk about education, that you have to ingrain and put in your books that you have to help changing to get a better world. And I think that you will be leaders on that. So thank you very much for inviting me for this moment. Uh, and I'll be here listening to uh, the panel uh, with a, a lot of interest. Mariana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Carlos Muedas. Uh, thank you um, for your sharings and for, for your learnings. So many challenges on leadership and sustainability, of course, self-conscious. So many things to think about and to learn. Uh, let me explain how uh, this will be working. Each roundtable, there are two roundtables based in one issue. Um, the first about education and training and the second one about trends in tourism. We have uh, five guests for each roundtable. Each guest we do a presentation and then we, we will have the opportunity to ask them questions. So feel free to ask whatever you want. In this first panel we will talk about how can we improve education and training in tourism. Which models we will follow. Uh, what does the sector need now? How can we promote development and adaptability to change? So, to share some ideas on tourism education and adaptability, please welcome Ramon O'Callaghan, Dean of Porto Business School. Welcome, Ramon. I think we have uh, some technical issues, right? So, um, Let's uh, wait a little bit to, to connect with Ramon. Uh, I imagine he's in Porto right now. So, hi Ramon, welcome. <laughs> I was unmuted and without video, but the organizers are not in. So we can start. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'll share my screen. I have a presentation as I have been asked to do. Let me see if you see it. Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm be talking about the impact on the industry, plus some opportunities for the future. The industry being uh, education. So. Um, as has been mentioned before the pandemic, uh, international tourism and travel had been growing constantly, even despite previous crises. But as the graph shows, COVID-19 has been brutally impacting the industry, like no previous crisis. And the UN World Tourism Organization estimates a loss of about 1 billion in international tourist inflow in 2020. The World Travel Tourism Council estimates a loss of about 50 million jobs in the industry worldwide. In Europe, the impact is huge, about 20 million jobs lost. This is about 40% of all jobs lost worldwide. And as has been mentioned before, the loss of jobs is most painful in those countries that are highly dependent on tourism. More specifically, where the share of tourism employment, the to total employment is highest. As you can see in the graph, by this measure, the most affected countries are Portugal, Greece, Croatia, and Cyprus, all above 
Moving forward, we see two major trends. One is digital technologies transforming the industry. And the other one, again, as has been uh, widely uh, cited before, a well-trained workforce to adapt to the new context. Regarding technology, it is obvious that the digital transformation will be accelerated. We are already seeing that in other industries. Teleworking, uh, flexible processes, fluid organizations, uh, redesign value chain, a new business model. In hospitality, we will see more contactless technologies and an increase in digitalization of customer interaction. But despite the increased digitalization and automation, the industry will continue to be as human intensive as always. Therefore, capital, human capital, will be the main driver for creating value in the post-COVID phase. A well-trained workforce with increased flexibility and creativity will help the industry go through the crisis and adapt to the new context. And it is here that education can play an important role. Tourism higher education has the potential to improve the competitiveness in the industry and tourism satisfaction uh, levels, tourist satisfaction levels, I mean. If education is so important, how are educational institutions uh, preparing for training the future professionals in the post-COVID uh, scenario? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? To answer this question, I did some uh, research and I found a study published very recently uh, based on the survey of 42 educators in different countries. And this is what they are concerned about. Of course, they are facing the challenges of implement, implementing digital learning like many educational institutions. But they are very concerned about the high unemployment in the industry caused by COVID. This potentially has negative consequences for education in the sense that the prospects for a career are not the same that they were before. This in turn deters or may affect negatively student enrollment. Hence, the need to redesign the curriculum, reposition the programs, and do better marketing to appeal and attract more students. They also mentioned the need for an increased collaboration with industry stakeholders and government. Regarding skills, the survey reported, not surprisingly, the importance of digital application, digital marketing, but also uh, vocational and problem solving skills and creativity. And bridging the gap between theory and practice through project based learning. Of course, given the days we are in, safety, risk management, business continuity, and resilience are also high on that list. But soft skills, are, have always been and continue to be extremely important. And they mentioned something like increased professionalism, meaning that visitors after COVID will be, how could I say, more picky and look for disciplined services in, in every aspect. So in essence, um, in uh, tourism education, the improvements can be in three areas, research, teaching, and stakeholder engagement. In research, by promoting ethical and sustainability research and looking for funded projects by the government. In teaching, focusing both theoretical and practical aspects, listening to and incorporating suggestions for professionals in the industry. And so that the revised curriculum includes uh, emerging issues. And as I mentioned before, stakeholder engagement, important agreement between academia, industry and government to develop and improve the industry and to help develop the required skills. Regarding stakeholder collaboration, most of you are probably familiar with the triple helix model of innovation, which refers to the set of interactions between academia, industry, and government to foster economic and social development. It has been widely adopted and applied by policymakers in the transformation of other sectors. The idea here is to adopt this framework to, for the tourism industry, taking into account the new priorities for digital and green investment. The EU Recovery and Resilience Facility will make loans and grants available to mitigate the economic and social impact of the pandemic. But these funds come with some strings attached. They are meant for investments to make European economies and societies more sustainable, resilient, 
and better prepared for the challenges and opportunities of the green and digital transition. The tourism industry can and should capitalize on this opportunity. The model is extended to include two other actors. The fourth actor is the wider community. After all, we are all travelers or tourists. And the fifth component is the natural environment, the socio-ecology. In total, this results into a quintuple helix or penta helix model. With the helix model, academia, government, and tourism industry can collaborate and utilize the UEA funds to prepare for the green and digital transition. They can also use media platforms to combat tourists' fear of traveling post-COVID and attract students to take courses that help them develop crisis management skills and other skills for the future. In summary, higher education can play an important role to improve the industry post-COVID. We need to prepare and train tourism professionals to be resilient through the crisis and adapt to the new context. The curriculum must incorporate three key subjects, risk management, digital transformation, and soft skills. The new courses may need to be repositioned and better marketed to attract reluctant candidates. The emphasis on practical training must persist. Learn to do, but also learn by doing. But students should also be involved in research projects, at least in higher education. Finally, the engagement and collaboration with stakeholders is crucial, as has been mentioned by previous speakers and as explained by the, in the uh, Penta Helix uh, model. Allow me to conclude and say a few uh, words about our institution and what we do at our institution. Porto Business School is the unit of the University of Porto that specializes on executive education and we offer MBAs, graduate programs, and open executive programs and customized uh, program for consulting and, and consulting for corporate clients. And we have successful, we have a successful program on tourism and hospitality management that focuses on hospitality, hotel operations, restaurant business and event management. It includes general management courses as well as digital operations and sustainability with a focus on local heritage and social inclusion. It, it encourages participants to think big, to take risks, and put ideas into practice. It also stimulates creativity by developing real projects. With a strong entrepreneurship focus, the program provides the tools that allow participants to start their own business. The program has a long history and a strong track record. With 15 editions, it is the oldest in Portugal. It has more than 270 alumni. Interesting to note that 20 participants are from the industry, 80% are from other backgrounds. These are people who want to change their lives by embracing projects in tourism and hospitality, and they need the skills to do so. We have students from all over the country, but also other countries, uh, Russia, Colombia, Spain, Italy, and also the Portuguese-speaking countries. Program, the program has had a significant impact. Uh, more than 50% of our past uh, students have already uh, realize their tourism projects. Uh, they have service companies, hospitality business, restaurants, bars, and the program is growing. In 2020, the 2024 intake, we have experienced a 25% increase in the number of applicants by COVID, or you could say even because of COVID, given that people would want to come to our school to get the skills necessary to manage some of the transitions. So I would say that our success lies in our ability to be in team with the tourist business, both nationally and internationally. We, we try to anticipate, not, to, not just follow or adapt to existing trends. As our program director likes to say, we help create the future. In anticipation of the future, we have already introduced important changes like digital marketing, booking technology, uh, booking platform technology, best management practices, benchmarking, and national and international success models in the hospitality and events and management. Uh, so, in essence, we strive to be relevant. We do it by listening to and working with the industry so that our participants get useful training and value for their investment. And finally, I'd like to conclude paraphrasing two uh, historic figures. You probably have heard that one before, but Churchill never let a good crisis go to waste. And Kennedy, the second time that we 
by him today. Um, he had this uh, wonderful quote, uh, when written in Chinese, the world, the word crisis is composed of two characters, one that represents danger and the other one that represents opportunity. So I hope that we can all get out of the COVID-19 danger quite soon and start focusing on the opportunities ahead. So thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you so much, Ramon. I have only one question because we, we are running out of time. So to wrap up this presentation um, and with this unpredictable crisis, what would we be the key challenges to higher education in tourism for the next few years? You're asking me directly or is it a question for the panel? This is a question of, uh, to you. <laughs> so the the... the the challenges are at different levels, I suppose, depending on, you're talking about the vocational uh, skills as we've talked before, and there are uh, management skills. We are school focused on, on management and education. And what we see is the importance of people to be more uh, creative, to mm -hmm. be more uh, professional, as I said before. So there's a, a lot uh, to be said for having uh, well-qualified and trained uh, professionals. So I think we all have a joint responsibility. As, as I said, there are different levels of education. Uh, we, we, we tackle the, the top segment, if you wish, but this has to be done at all uh, different levels. So resilience, I think it's, it's important, but I would say uh, creativity and, and soft skills, uh, very important, not just the, the hard skills that obviously uh, people have to uh, learn and go through. Mm -hmm. So the, in the future, we will have to, to learn about resilience and about these soft skills in the university and other courses, right? Yes, and, and, and that's, that's part of the, of, the, of the challenge that we all have because we tend to be much more focused on, on hard skills. This is the, the easier part. That's what you find in the books. A lot of the things of soft skills are done uh, by, by, by doing, by interacting with others, by working on real projects. So, and, and in our case, uh, we have a good track record also of, of picking up trends. So try to anticipate, not just to, to follow. And, and you do that by having good antennas, with having good connections to uh, people in the industry that are facing the challenges and try to work with them to identify those challenges and, and be proactive uh, in, in finding solutions jointly for the future. That's why the interconnection that's not only with the industry but i think the the, the the triple helix model that we're talking about you know creating perhaps what you see in in other industries in, in high tech uh, hubs of innovation or or centers of, of innovation with uh, business centers incubators and so on it's something that should be perhaps replicated in a, in a larger scale than it is done today for the industry mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Ramon, for, for being here with us today. And following uh, our edu this education needs, we, we will go deeper in the sector. So please welcome Karin Girard, Head of Human Resources, Spain and Portugal, Accor Group. Hi, Karin. Are you there? Hi. Yes, I am here. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, very much. Okay, very great. Okay, so um, so thank you very much for the invitation to this forum. I am very pleased to be with all of you and uh, and to have this, the opportunity to explain how was the impact for us that you can imagine it was gigantic and also uh, how we want to move on in order to uh, recover as soon as possible from this crisis and what actions are we going to put in place. So so I'm going to be very pleased to share with you my presentation. Hopefully I am able to do this. Hold on just a minute. Uh, let's see. Okay. Please, let me know if you can see it. See it. Okay. So uh, the, the presentation is very much uh, self, uh, you know, 
ex explanatory because we really want to move forward. This has been such a difficult year. Uh, unfortunately, we had to do different uh, labor uh, actions because it was impossible to maintain all the employees working 100% of the time, as you might know. And uh, this, also, of course, has affected very much the environment. And uh, and this is why we, we want to move forward and, and do all the actions to be ready for what's going in, coming up next uh, and and we wish to be recovered by the summer although uh, you know we are living in in such an uncertainty that uh, we don't know what's going to happen but in any case we want to move forward and um, I would like to present you pretty much what we have been doing uh, from from now and especially what we're going to do for the future so I'm going to try to share the whole presentation do you see it very well right now Yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, TNC is talent and culture. So that's the Department of Human Resources. And I wanted to explain pretty much what we have been doing up to now. So the, the main role that we have in ACO, we have 135 hotels and uh, around 2,000 employees uh, as a whole. Uh, half of uh, the hotels are managed uh, which means ACO is managing directly the hotels and half of it is uh, there are franchises, which, which means there are uh, different owners and, uh, and they, just, uh, they just take the brand and the distribution and all the services related with sales. So what we do is support the business um, and of course train and develop hundreds of uh, ACO employees and, uh, from the hotels. We have a really large training offer and we focus on especially all the operations, the revenue management, client experience, talent management and leadership. And uh, we make a lot of tailor-made programs as each one of the hotels has a very different uh, situation and, uh, and also, um, and also it's, it's located in, in very different parts of the peninsula. Then we work with all the partners, which are the owners, the, um, all the employees, and also the directors of each one of the hotels. And we also implement a lot of motivation programs and hospitality programs, because this is the key of the success for, for Accor, to be uh, very much close to the clients and also to the employees. So to make a long story short, how was 2020? Well you know, a very challenging year. We had uh, a visitant that we did not expect, uh, which is the COVID-19. And uh, this, of course, had a, a horrible effect on our business. So after minus 4.2% of GDP decrease in 2020, and uh, but we expect a rebound in 2021. But as, as you can see, uh, in general, the, 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 you know, the numbers are really uh, are not good. And, uh, the, the, and we hope really to have this rebound, and especially for summer 2021. Uh, at that time, well, this is, it has to be, uh, now we have more vaccines, we have Moderna as well, we have a couple of ones, but uh, many of them in December were approved for emergency use and, uh, and now all the vaccination um, uh, campaigns are, are happening in each one of the countries. Hopefully we are successful by the summer. Uh, but it depends pretty much on the countries and also the um, how quick we we move on with the vaccine. Um, so what happened during this period? Of course, uh, the the way that we have to work has changed a lot. So for the head office, for example, for all, all the offices and the back offices, uh, everything changed. We have been working in in remote. Uh, we also try to think about ways to work without so much occupancy in the buildings. And uh, at the same time, we needed to motivate the employees because it's really hard when you have to work from home for a long time um, to keep on having the motivation because people need to socialize. This is the, the human nature. So we had to find the right balance uh, for to maintain the motivation and to move forward. 
for the hotels, um, we, you know, thinking forward, we we think we have many different opportunities to reinvent the business. For instance, with uh, the co-working, using the meeting rooms in a different way, private offices, like using the bedrooms and also the meeting rooms as private offices. So we are working with different solutions with Wojo, which is the co-working company that we have in Accor, and also to at the same time to uh, to offer the best quality services. So business-wise, we are trying to reinvent ourselves because uh, this this has been a long crisis and is not over yet. So we need to try to reinvent. And uh, for the in hotel office opportunities for corporate clients as well, uh, we uh, we make we try to make tailor-made solutions and uh, and increase also the employee satisfaction uh, with with uh, with the new these new projects. So what's going to happen? So so what about us, like employees? Because um, you know, we, we're thinking again about how to boost the business, how to uh, to increase the sales, the revenue. But of course, uh, this cannot be done without motivated employees and, and with a strong state of mind. So, so what about us? I mean, the most important thing when we have a crisis, even if we don't have a crisis, but the most important thing for an employee is, okay, so... I'm working in this company. Uh, I know we have a crisis. I know that we have to increase our skills. We have to increase uh, the motivation and so on. But what's in there for me? So the number one question that employees have is, um, okay, what's going to be my future in this company? What tools I'm going to be offered? What is my career plan? So what's in there for me? Not only for me, but also for all the teams, like the leadership team. How they are going to manage these situations. So we have to rethink about how um, to make the employees stronger in a very challenging time, but especially for the recovery. Because, for instance, China now have 95% of occupancy in many of the hotels that we have in Accor. And uh, suddenly the business came back like crazy. And the employees needed to be absolutely ready for that. And, uh, and we don't know what's going to happen in Europe. Probably we're going to have the same situation. Hopefully we're going to have the same situation. So we need to get everybody ready for that. And also, um, how are we going to work this rebound? What tools are we going to have in order to be stronger, in, or, in order to be ready? Um, the key is the culture in Accor. That's the number one key is, number one, to have a self-development, to be self-aware and have the feeling of be belonging. The employees need to know that they are important for the company and that we count on them. That's the number one thing. The second number one, th the second thing is going to be have, uh, to have the best tools to operate digital tools, uh, training tools, in order to also achieve all the results, not only towards the clients, but also from the results of the company. And, uh, and then have an exemplary leadership in a very challenging environment. So we need to train the leaders. We need to make them understand that we have been having a really stressful situation. Some people maybe need some help. So they have to be aware of, of, um, of uh, the help, they, the support they need to give to all the employees. And, uh, but, but that's why we need also to train them and to make them aware of that. And of course, the company has, has always to be people oriented, which means to make them participate in uh, this new recovery, this new times that we're going to face, to understand they have to be more competitive, to have the best communication in the company. Uh, that's that's uh, the main point uh, to, to make the people engaged in this project, to recognize the big effort that everybody is doing, to have fun, of course, even is in, in a complicated time, we need to have a little fun. And uh, that's a very important issue also that we are facing. And then respect and understanding uh, uh, in, in this challenging time. So for that, we have planned a resilience plan. Uh, and how are we going to do this? Well, number one, 
we are going to try to increase the engagement with the, the sentiment of belonging. So many different actions are going to be done uh, during these six months. Uh, like, for instance, to explain what is Accor for them and what is there, what is there uh, in the company for them, for all the employees, to rediscover Accor. So, okay, we have a project. It's a very important project. We want to reinvent the business and we want to explain to all the employees how we are going to reinvent it. And uh, this is why we're going to make a new onboarding for all the employees to make them understand that the business is changing all the time uh, and we need to adapt and uh, we need to uh, be very creative in order to uh, move on into this business. Then train everybody on change management and how to deal with uncertainty, increase different skills in this different time, so work on people capabilities, work on the career plan to make sure that we retain all this talent that is absolutely key for the moment that we are going to face. Internal movement movements program also because we need to make sure that all the employees are very polyvalent and uh, are able to do very different things. We boost the Hearties program, which is uh, the motivation program, the uh, or the uh, people-oriented and client-oriented program. This is the DNA of Accor. Everybody's heart is, which means we are artists of the heart. So everybody in the head offices and the hotels, everyone has the same vision, and we we need to reboost that. Then, um, of course, there is a big, big uh, portion of the tools. So what tools we are going to provide to all the employees? Number one tool is hygiene and protection. We need to make sure that everyone is working in a very safe environment uh, from the sanitary uh, perspective and also the mental perspective. So we are going to offer not only webinars and safety advices, but also psychological help. Uh, after uh, this this moment of suffering, many people need that. So we are going to be very close to to them in 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 this concern. Then we are going to deploy. We we are already deployed uh, digital management tools and uh, digital learning packages, but we are going to increase this offer. We need to make sure that uh, when people work, they also need they also know how to uh, use the tools and uh, how to make um, the best benefit of these tools. Then find eff efficient solutions for a more efficient organization. So try to think much simpler and um, uh, make people learn how to, to think simpler and uh, to find simple solutions for the, for the problems of the day-to-day. Like I said, adapt all the processes that we have to digital. So all the simple, even the simpler processes to make them di digital and to not waste any time uh, thinking about, uh, you know, like manual things that make us uh, waste a lot of time. Then create a learning community, uh, a commentoring community, a coaching community to make sure that we support each other and we learn from each other, from all the experiences that we have been living for this past year. Then recognition tools, talent management tools, flexibility and balance in the working conditions uh, to understand better the balance between the, per the personal and professional uh, life of each one of the employees. And of course, training. I'm going to show you a little bit what training that we have. It's a very, like, in a nutshell uh, description. And then, uh, regarding the leadership of the organization, we need, like I said before, uh, they need training, focus on emotional intelligence, closeness, and care. People need support. People need help, and uh, and the management has to be very close to them. Training on talent management tools, awareness, reinforce meetings, town halls with up-to-date information for all the employees, the transparency and the communication and the information to all the employees is absolutely key uh, in challenging times. It's always key, but more now more than ever. Uh, reinforce internal communication, of course, uh, communication follow-up in the leadership team, which means to make sure that all the managers are communicating uh, what's going on in the company and the plans of the company and the strategy, recognition and team management in a certain environment also. Um, uh, it's, it's key to retain the talents. So 
that would be pretty much the uh, resilience plan for the first semester and with a follow-up for the second semester. And uh, so I put a couple of slides in Portuguese, okay? So uh, um, the orientations of, of training 2021, the three pillars that uh, we are going to offer to all the employees from the hotels and the, uh, and, uh, and the head offices are going to be the back to basics to make sure that uh, everybody knows the brands, uh, you know, they, they know how to attend the clients and of course all the security and the sanitary uh, training that, that they're going to need to face this COVID-19 uh, situation. Then the second pillar is um, to increase the business. So uh, to, to know more about the processes of the business, the revenue management, for instance, sales and so on. And the third one is how to lead a new reality. I don't want to call it the new normality because nothing is going to be normal from now on, or at least the normal that we used to know before. So it's just a new reality that uh, will become normal but it's absolutely new and we need to be able to to have uh, the best leaders for uh you know teams that are going to be much more reduced probably and also how to deal in a very uncertain context uh that didn't finish yet and uh of course since uh we are not able to make a presential learning so everything is going to be digital so we're going to have e-learning courses like in capsules and also virtual sessions with a teacher or with a mentor or with a coach uh, depending on each one of the courses that we are going to uh, we are going to train and we have to remember i mean we we are a very important sector and we are a strong company ago is a very strong company uh, we have a lot of strengths like a very engaged team we have a really huge onboard feeling. We are one, the, the team is really consolidated. Uh, the, the, the partnership that we have with all the stakeholders is really strong. Uh, you know, ACO is very well respected in the environment also. Then also we are very proud to have uh, many uh, different um, strengths in, 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 for instance, in diversity or also in talent. We have made many movements and promotions in one year. We have many mobility opportunities within the group. And also uh, uh, th there is more and more balance between men and women in uh, different positions and especially in management positions. Uh, but we have many challenges in front of us. And this is why I explained before the, the resilience plan, but we have to be aware of these challenges and uh, we have to be aware that we need to face them and uh, to recover. So uh, in spite of the situation, the, the employees, they need to be engaged. And this is why we're going to work very closely to them, with them. Then to have a balance between personal and professional life, that's really important because otherwise people are not happy and then they cannot do a good job. That's, that's for sure. To have an employee and employer branding in spite of a really complicated situation. And of course, to be efficient and to move forward into the business i believe we can do it okay and uh and uh we have a a, a winner there that i guess you all know right uh vamos la we're on fire i'm sure that we're gonna make it and uh we look forward to to succeed during this 2021 year and that's pretty much it so if you have any question maybe or any uh comment Hi, Karin. Thank you so much for your sharings. I have two questions that Thank can you. be that can be resumed in one, I guess. So the first one sure. is with all this information, contradictory information and new measures all the, um, every day. Uh, how was it for you to manage um, in one way the measures and all these adaptations and the other hand, uh, the emotions and the people you, you manage? And uh, the second one would be um, what uh, will be the, the key skills to, to the new worker on the, um, on, the on the future of tourism? Okay, so um, so for to answer to your first question, what we did always was 
to be very transparent with everybody, okay, about what was going on in the business, because people need to be aware that uh, the situation has changed totally. They were aware already, because many of them, they were, uh, you know, in layoffs, for instance, in Portugal, because they, if, they, if there is no business, there is no, no point. It's totally pointless for people to be there, of course. So they were they were totally aware of that. But uh, in order for them to uh, know pretty much where we're going, we were very transparent in the communication, and uh, and also we made sure that people understood that Accor is taking a lot of care of the sanitary conditions, so mm -hmm. they feel free to work and they feel safe to work in the organization knowing that all the measures were taken. And of course, we uh, to make sure that we found the right balance between the measures and also the motivation and uh, you know the strength for people to, uh, to still go and to still work in, in, in the best way possible, what we did was a lot of training and uh, a lot of town halls and uh, like I said, a lot of communication and to explain how, for instance, for the summer, we had the reopenings of many hotels. So we explained really precisely with all details how we are going to make the reopening. And at that point, many, uh, we had many different courses regarding motivation and sanitary measures. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we tried to be really close to the employees at that point. And, uh, and then regarding the skills, well, I think the most important one is, um, you know, to be adaptable, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to be adaptable in the sense that, you know, situations can change very quickly for, and uh, it's changing, it's still changing all the time. So we need to uh, make sure that we can adapt to, uh, to each step of, of uh, this crisis and for the future as well. So that would be, uh, I think, the most the most important one. And the second one is, is resilience. So um, you know, to always see the bright side of the situation, and uh, and uh, and to try to be op optimistic. So I think adaptability, resilience, optimism, trying to be positive. I think that's the skills that we're going to need, mm -hmm. and to try to simplify the processes, to try to make uh, life simpler to the employees, life simpler for uh, the colleagues and for the clients, and uh, to move on quickly. So that's, at least in my experience, I think that we need people with these skills in mm -hmm. this industry. Okay. Thank you so much, Karina, for your time and for your sharings. Thank now, you. uh, back Thanks. to our panels, we have uh, Bettina Naubauer, uh, Head of Quality Management and Concepts, from TUI Germany, the group. Hi, Bettina. Are you there? Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank okay. you. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> So isn't this a picture where we would all like to be right now, relaxing and dreaming again? And I really hope that we have this feeling, we all will have this feeling again this summer and our guests will have this feeling to be somewhere they can relax and have positive thoughts. Hello and good morning. My name is Bettina Neubauer and I'm the head of quality management and hotel consultancy and hotel concepts for TUI Germany. And I would like to talk to you today about the customer expectation today and in the future and how does this influence leadership, staffing and processes as well as trainings in our hotels. So, as many of you know, we have uh, at TUI a guest survey, a very um, detailed and professional guest survey. And in this guest survey, our clients tell us their opinion. They are telling us what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, they tell us also things about the staff in the hotel, so we can really learn from our guests. And today, the main customer satisfaction drivers, as we call them, so those things that are most important for our guests are room condition, food and beverage, and service of staff in a hotel. Of course, there are some others, but those are the most important today. And this guest survey is something that we ask our guests after his return. 
So he comes back and gives us, us his opinion with, it, with what is helpful. But I think in the future, what we should do more is ask the client right away. I know that many hotels are already doing it, but I think we can do this more and get better in it. And digital is one solution how we can do it. So, for example, um, many hotels already have their own app and um, even in leisure tourism, not only in the business uh, sector. And um, our brands like Robinson, Tui Magic Live or Tui Blue, they have their own app and guests can make re restaurant reservations and they can um, book up sellings, but they can also give feedback there. So many hotels use the digital solution, an app or other tools, WhatsApp also sometimes, um, to ask the client right away, how do you like it? Is there something that we can do for you? And I think this um, can make the client happier in the moment. But it means that the staff has to be flexible on that moment as well. So the after um, travel survey stays important. Of course, we will always do that. Um, but digital and being flexible will be important in the future it already is. And the digital and flexible um, topic really belongs to the health and safety topic, or we can uh, connect them. Because we saw last summer um, when the crisis erased that uh, many uh, hotels already connected the digital topic with health and safety to make the client feel safer. So what you could do, for example, uh, many hotels did a, a, an online check-in, so there was no contact involved anymore. So it really enables processes and service, services without physical presence, and that helped a lot. And I think that um, there are many hotels who can go more into detail in this topic. Of course, the digital topic is something that will become more, but the human factor will stay important. It is a person who makes who solves the problem and who makes the people happy. An app may um, tell what is the problem, but a person comes um, to our clients and helps with a smile on his face, ideally. So these are some of the factors. And of course, as mentioned before, sustainability will stay important. And the topic of health and safety and sustainability, um, I think in the future has to work better together. Last summer, we had a lot of clients um, that commented on sustainability because the health and they were overwhelmed by health and safety, but then they commented, unfortunately, there were more plastic used, more um, single use material, which was obvious and the hotels had to do it. But I think that is something that we um, have to look, have a look at um, this summer or even for the future, of course, on the long term. So all these main drivers that you see on the left side, room condition, food and beverage, service of stuff, of course, they stay important and they will always be important. But in the future, digital health and safety, human factors, sustainability, and of course, many others will also influence the hotel management and the trainings and um, our TUI brands as well. And we as a hotel consultancy, we offer trainings in all these areas. We offer trainings, of course, in room condition, food and beverage, service of staff, but also leadership trainings. We do mystery checks and we uh, sell different analysis. And of course, we are, will also be flexible in the future and offer, include in our trainings, the topics that are digital or health and safety, etc. cetera. Um, but we will also keep training our hotel partners and talking with our hotel partners about the main satisfaction drivers because they stay important. So the customer feedback and the topics that we erase from it um, really influences the processes in a hotel, the trainings, the leadership and the personnel. And well, why personnel? Um, personnel is a very um, important topic and I would like to talk about a new generation. Of course, there's not only this new generation, but if we look at 
you can call them millennials. There are different names for them. Let's say the 20 between 30, 20 between 35 year old people. Um, they, many of them are more demanding. They're not accepting everything anymore. So they have a different mindset of maybe older or other people. And um, the key factor here is the leadership. The leadership, they have to know this new generation. They have to have development programs, retention programs. They have to listen to the people. And um, furthermore, of course, they have to know this new generation and approach them. And of course, our guests, more and more of our guests will belong to this new generation. So we all have to know everything about them regarding stuff and also regarding our guests. And um, all this feedback and all these new topics, of course, will influence um, our trainings that we offer to our hotel partners. We will change our um, trainings, of course, our products. We are in strong contact with our um, with our guests, uh, with our hotel partners. So all these factors, health and safety, of course, will be the important factor of the next years. And after the corona crisis, it will stay important, but also the digital top topic and the human factor and sustainability. All this will influence our partnership, our work with our hotel partners, our products, and of course, our work with destinations. We work with tourist boards and hotel associations. And um, I know that these times are difficult uh, to invest and it's a crisis time, but there was a consumer survey of last year. And the most important reason for people to choose a travel company in 2020 and 2021 will be quality. So the hotels have to invest in quality now because quality will remain the key for success. And uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask me. Thank you, Bettina. Thank you so much for your sharings. I have one question. Uh, I would like to know, in your in your opinion, uh, what would uh, how can how can you how can hotels and groups uh, attract new talent um, and and make the um, the sector as sexy as he, he was be it was before the pandemic era? Please, if you can share some some ideas with us. Yes. I think it's very important that we um, that we listen to the people, um, that we are working closely together, and communication is the key. Um, as Karin said before, you have to stay in contact um, with the people, even if they're working in home office. And uh, of course, you need attractive programs like development programs. But if you listen to the people and if you're in strong contact, then you already know how how they feel and um, if they like to still work in your company. So this is very important. And of course, um, I think you have also um, integrate talents in defining new strategies for the restart. So once the business gets back again, um, leadership or the leaders should not work on their own. They should involve um, their personnel. That's very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Bettina, for uh, for being with us today. So next next speaker is Peter Axon, policy analyst uh, uh, for region uh, regional development and tourism division of OECD. Hi, Peter. Are you there? Welcome. Uh, yes, uh, I am indeed. Thank you very much. Um, I will share my screen as the other. Thank you speakers have done. Is that good for everyone? Yes, we have it already. Okay. Not quite sure why that's happening. Um, okay, so um, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to um, 
thank you very much for the opportunity to to join you today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to represent the OECD um, to discuss uh, our current work um, and to contribute to this discussion on what is a, such an important and, and pressing topic. Uh, as part of its 2019-20 uh, uh, program of work, the OECD Tourism Committee uh, is uh, developing a report on preparing the tourism workforce uh, for the digital future, which is undertaken with the financial support of the European Commission, uh, Portugal and Switzerland. Uh, the report provides an in-depth analysis of the impact of digital technologies uh, on the nature of work in the tourism sector and the skills uh, needed to adapt to changes in the workplace technologies and to succeed in digital value chains. Uh, it takes uh, into account digitalization changes within a COVID-19 context uh, and the likely repercussions for jobs and skills with a particular focus on tourism SMEs. And drawing on, the, on responses uh, to a country survey, the report focuses on three key areas. Uh, these are digital technologies and emerging impacts on, on tourism jobs, uh, skill shortages and gaps in the digital tourism economy, and policy responses to prepare the tourism workforce. It then provides a selection of policy considerations to help the sector to, to leverage the opportunities offered by the digital economy. Um, and at the national and regional levels and, and potential collaborations at the international level also. It's not allowing me to change slides. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, in in considering the emerging impacts of digital technologies on work in tourism, the, the report highlights that um, digitalization is, is shifting from a driver of marginal efficiency uh, to an um, enabler of fundamental innovation and change business processes. Uh, uptake has been uneven and the multiple technologies involved have already led to transformations across many parts of the sector, uh, providing opportunities for value creation, but also representing a major source of risk. As a disruptive technology, it's necessary to consider the, the strategic implications of these transformations for organisations, uh, industry ecosystems uh, and society more broadly, and to better understand the opportunities and challenges created. Indeed, uh, these opportunities and challenges have intensified due to COVID-19, uh, which is expected, as, as was mentioned previously by Ramon, I believe, uh, to result in, 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 a, in an acceleration of digital uptake and integration in many of the tourism subsectors. Uh, Digitalisation can spur innovation and productivity growth and it is changing the way work is organised and, and tourism workers will need different skills, not just more skills uh, to thrive in the digital economy. The report also explores how digitalization affects uh, the demand for skills in tourism. Uh, and while it's clear that technology uh, will impact on most tourism jobs to some extent, there is a risk of, of overstating the, the comparative advantage of technology over people, uh, with the accommodation and food services subsector being one particular example, where, where personalized service is particularly valued by customers. Most change will come from introducing or enhancing digital systems or tools into existing job structures, resulting in uh, new skills mixes and hybridized uh, jobs, combining complementary and often transversal skills with the basic level of digital fluency. Understanding the current and emerging skills consequences of digitalization is especially important uh, for tourism, where there is a legacy of challenges uh, in both skill shortages and gaps with each requiring a, a different remedial approach. Skill shortages, for instance, uh, call for a more holistic approach with sector stakeholders working through the various tiers of the education and, and training sector uh, to ensure a closer match uh, between labour supply and demand. Uh, while in, in bridging the skills gaps, the focus is much more on employers individually or collectively uh, developing appropriate uh, training and retaining uh, responses, although the, the nudging role of a wider policy has an important role to play also. It's also worth noting that tourism SMEs, as is the case in many other sectors, often lag in the digital transformation, and they are also uh, quite often the hardest uh, to reach 
with policy responses. The current situation uh, might be described as a, as a perfect storm of pressures facing the sector, uh, including uh, slow digital adjustment, uh, rising pressures for diverse digitalization skills needs and, and compound competencies, and the need to work with the sector, and especially smaller SMEs, struggling to build business recovery and resilience in a post-COVID environment. While many problems in, in, in what I should say, while any problems in meeting future skills needs are likely to exert a drag on, on digital transformation of the sector. Education and training providers will play a crucial role in the future supply of skills, as well as contributing uh, to skills development in the existing workforce. However, to be effective agents of change, uh, providers of initial and continuing education and training uh, must be able to respond to, to clear signals from the labour market on emerging skills gaps and needs in the future. Equally, in order to reflect the needs of employers, uh, cooperation will be required in curriculum development. A particular feature of, of continuing education and training adjustment, adjustment is likely to be how the sector responds to the needs of workers uh, displaced by incoming technologies or at risk of doing so. Uh, with three-way localised collaboration between firms, education and training providers and, and, and the public employment services playing an important role. National policies will need to be responsive to the diversity of needs across the sector and, and the varying levels of digital maturity amongst enterprises and, and also people, as well as being sufficiently agile to take advantage of new technologies and workforce opportunities as they arise. I'll briefly touch upon a few of these policy uh, responses here today. Uh, firstly, uh, strengthening national skills intelligence to inform uh, firms and educational reform. This will require a, a deeper look at the capabilities of national labour market intelligence processes to guide future skills assessments uh, in and across tourism as well as how this information needs to be harnessed uh, by education and training providers and enterprises uh, planning for their futures. Secondly, encouraging stronger work-related adjustment training for the existing workforce. Uh, to avoid individual enterprises needing to reinvent the wheel, policymakers uh, should invest in collaborative, SME-friendly and, where possible, ready-made subsector-based training packages to support access, engagement and reduce costs of workforce re- and upskilling. In addition, uh, the need to develop support for displaced and at-risk workers is another area of focus. Uh, this will require publicly funded employment and, uh, sorry, I should say, and here initiatives will be most effective where there is a close collaboration between enterprises, training providers and public employment services, providing early intervention and, and re-employment assistance for workers regardless of the type of employment contract. And finally, providing enhanced access to adult learning will be critical. Uh, for example, this will include an investment to improve the contribution and readiness of learning systems to support digitalization in tourism. Uh, this raises wider issues for national continuing edu education capabilities, including strengthening adult learning funding, uh, developing education and training providers' digital capabilities, and, and building greater technological resilience to help prevent future skills uh, depreciation. And finally, policy responses will need to, to tackle access, uh, access barriers for those who need improved skills mixes, but, but where there is currently low levels of engagement. And I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for your sharings. I have one question for you. Uh, which are the key challenges for qualification and for requalification um, sect, uh, in this sector for the next years? Um, well, from the evidence from our particular work, there's, there's a little bit uh, ambitious f f for that. But uh, what, I, what I would suggest is that um, the challenges that, that are facing uh, public policy makers uh, include, for instance, um, how the state can, can usefully offer more and better subsidies for education and training capacity development aimed at, uh, at, at tourism digitalization. Mm -hmm. And the question is also how can public policy leverage its potential, 
potentially large uh, influence over enabling how fast innovation can, can diffuse, diff, diffuse through uh, the sector, uh, including ensuring that legacy structures uh, such as regulation and key infrastructure in rural broadband, for example, do not hold up aspirations and adjustments within the sector. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Peter, for your sharings and for your answer. Talking about innovation, we have our last uh, speaker on this first panel. Uh, welcome, I, I, I would like to welcome Natalia Bayona, Director of the Innovation, Education and Investments Department at UNWTO. Hi Natalia, how are you? Welcome. Natalia, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Hello. It's my <laughs> pleasure you. to be here today and to just um, end this panel. So basically, as you all know, uh, education is here to stay. And uh, one part of, of our main job here in the UNWTO is to encourage youth as a way of creating new knowledge and of course as a way of adding value and new jobs. So I would like to share my screen just for a second. Thank you. Mm, here we are. So mm, why is education is a top priority for the UNWTO? So there are some critical overviews regarding uh, education. So uh, I'm not going to repeat the importance of tourism as a top economic sector. Of course, uh, it's one of the main um, economies or, or sectors that has been affected the most due to the pandemic. But uh, as we lead the, the contribution for employment, that's why education is crucial because I don't know if you know, but uh, we are tourism at the top employer of youth. So when we see the top uh, countries that are focusing on tourism, like the US, the UK, Germany, France, Portugal, Greece, Italy, youth is a strong component of employment in travel and tourism. Nonetheless, and of course, nonetheless, here is the strong challenge that we have. Most of them, only have primary and uh, secondary education. So that's why if we want to develop a strong recovery and to preserve jobs or to create added value jobs, education is crucial here. So um, on the other side, tourism is the top employer of women as well. We are uh, leading by example the gender equality nonetheless, we only have 23% of the ministers of tourism are women. So we need to improve uh, in order to mind this gap. And uh, this is very important as well. When we talk about the challenges on the skills development in tourism, there is a strong uh, thing to take into account. We are multitaskers by nature. It doesn't matter if we are talking about managerial or vocational skills. So I give you here an example. When we are talking about cooking, that is part of our uh, gastronomy and tourism, uh, it's not only about uh, being a good chef, it's about um, working uh, in, in a cuisine, it's about quality, it's about uh, innovation between the um, fusion versus traditional, it's um, choosing the good ingredients, it's about being efficient and uh, speedy in time, etc. So uh, the most demanded skills in, in tourism nowadays, when we are talking about non-digital is about uh, soft skills, analytical thinking, critical thinking, creativity, coordination of people, emotional intelligence, problem solving that is part of our daily basis in tourism. And when we are talking about tech, the most demanding skills are, of course, focused on the most important technologies that are developed in tourism that are blockchain, artificial intelligence, internet of things, virtual and augmented reality, big data, among others. So uh, this is an um, um, economic graph 
that last year the World Economic Forum did regarding the merging roles uh, into the jobs of tomorrow. And I can feel that in every single cluster that I see here, tourism is part of every single group. Because when we talk about sales, it's tourism, people and culture, of course, because we are the most uh, um, human economic sector. When it comes about data as well, because data is the, the power that help us to take better decisions. When we talk about cloud computing and content production as well, because uh, the people that work in tourism are storytellers. So content production is crucial, but on the other side, uh, having in the engineering skills is crucial as well if we want a more modern and innovative uh, sector. So once again, this is a very transversal sector. And once again, uh, the barriers that we uh, have been seen in the UNWTO are focused always on the skills because digital transformation has been acting so fast in the, in the sector, nonetheless, our uh, talent and our uh, employees are not that aligned with those new uh, tasks that are needed to work in the sector. So, and this is another thing that is really important, uh, when we go to work on data in jobs in the tourism sector, there is no updated data as well. So it's another challenge that we have today here. It's an example, um, Spain, for example, that is a, a, a role model in tourism only have data uh, regarding jobs of 2016. Uh, so just to conclude this part of this critical overview, of course, uh, during this uh, pandemic, uh, what is uh, really important is that lifelong learning is here as a mandatory uh, way to unlearn, learn and relearn, because of course, that's the way of how we can think about being more resilient and of course, more strongest, uh, stronger in order to have a better opportunity. So uh, the opportunities for, for youth are really important, as I already said, in tourism. Uh, I, I can say that it's not only about employing them, Half of the youth, this is a, a, um, um, this is a, um, a survey that uh, we did with MasterCard Foundation for financial inclusion. O almost 50% of the youth that works in tourism, uh, they want to start their own business in the sector. So they want to become entrepreneurs. They want to become a startup uh, and build a startup. So that's why we need more than ever to develop a more innovative and entrepreneurial mindset in order to be aligned with the desires of the people that are working in the sector and the needs that the sector has. Mm. So here um, you will find how we are working in our UNWTO education strategy. So as you know, what we want and what we decided is that we need to work on a hybrid 360 education strategy. Uh, starting by online education, then complement online education with offline education, of course, to help and to give opportunities to create added value jobs, and last but not least, to assure quality in this sector. So what is the UNWTO doing for this? Uh, regarding online education, we have the UNWTO Online Academy, that is a platform where top universities from all around the world can upload uh, added value content in order to massify high level content and help us to scale up the way people are educated. So people after they do the, the courses there, get the certification of the top university and the UNWTO. Uh, for the time being, we have almost 10,000 students uh, uh, with us from more than 100 nationalities, but we need more. So of course, I encourage all the Europeans that are uh, working on education today, that if you're interested, of course, contact us because our um, goal is to scale up this until having 500,000 students in five years. So the challenge is huge, but I know that we can do it together as a team. Of course, because of line, online education, it's not everything, but of course, it's the first way uh, today to open doors in tourism. Uh, 
we are working as well on offline education. So once you finish your journey with us in the Tourism Online Academy, we bring you the opportunity to come to our house to Madrid to uh, still being educated or to develop different courses and workshops on the field, on your countries with our um, universities network. We work with, with more than 100 universities all around the world. So that's the way how we are mixing this. And we are working uh, to develop uh, an added value jobs platform to link the online academy with a jobs factory in order to help those that are uh, proactive and that are studying for a better future uh, to um, have at least some job opportunities and to be connected with those companies that are interested in hiring youth and talented minds that are educated uh, for a more modern tourism. And last but not least, of course, uh, we are still working. We have our certification process that is TEDQUAL, where we have hundreds of universities all around the world that has been aligned with our tourism strategy. So um, with that said, um, this is how we see education today. We have to start by online education because of course it's the first path then to jump by uh, offline uh, education and uh, to add value to that first online journey. And of course, to interact with the students uh, in order to offer them job opportunities because education is not only to serve and to promote and to and to train it's a, uh, um, it's um it's an engaging process where we need people as well to be engaged and to see that education matters and that they have the opportunity to uh, be engaged and uh, to uh, to a good job uh, in the mid future and of course to see how quality matters and uh, how certifications and how we monitor education is crucial in order to mind that gap that I uh, already said, that is a strong gap uh, that we have. But of course, that's our mandate as a UN agency. And uh, of course, here uh, we have uh, Portugal today as the president of the council, but I have to say, that Portugal is the co-chair as well of the UNWTO Online Education Committee. So uh, once again, uh, it shows how um, those talented countries full of tourism and innovation are committed on this 360 journey. And we know that of course, with the aim and with the cooperation of the member states and the universities, that public and private collaboration we can scale up the way people are educated and of course uh, we can uh, begin a new journey focused on delivering a more modern, sustainable and of course innovative tourism sector. So thanks a lot once again for your um, invitation today and we will be pleased to work with you uh, in order to uh, scale up the way people are educated. Here I have a question that says uh, where you can find everything regarding education. Um, everything is in the UNWTO website. And if you wanna enroll some courses uh, of the online academy, it's really easy. You just put in Google UNWTO online academy and it's the first link that it appears. So I really encourage all the people that are um, listening to, to us today to enroll the, those courses, to lead by example, and to be the ambassadors of online education and tourism for good. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you for your presentation. I have uh, only one question for you. I would like to know how can you, um, you, you, told, you told us about, about new generations, about new talent, about youth. How can you guarantee that the teachers and instructors are ready to, uh, to teach this new way of uh, doing tourism and these new uh, tools? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And um, I am going to give an example of Portugal. So uh, to empower youth, you need, of course, 
to give them the tools and uh, to build the specific programs where they can lead the change. That's why we decided to create the Global Startup Competitions. We received more than 10,000 applications from more than 150 countries. But once, for example, the winners of those startup competitions work with us, with the UNWTO and with the innovation ecosystem, most of the startups and most of those young, uh, talented minds come to us. And uh, here is how this is a win-win situation. For example, Hi Hifi, that is one of the winners of the 2020 mm -hmm. Global Startup Competition that is from Portugal, they told me, like, hey, Natalia, I would like to be a teacher and to help other entrepreneurs and to help other talented minds to be and to build good business plan as I have been uh, doing it. So once uh, you empower uh, some of them as winners of some competitions or some challenges and they work actively with you, they become ambassadors and they want to cooperate and to train and to give the same opportunities to other uh, young generations in order to massify and to spread the voice on new technologies and um, entrepreneurship um, skills. So what I think is that today, this uh, startup revolution has helped us to um, create a strong innovation network that is not only helping to build new technologies, but also to create new uh, profiles of people that have become entrepreneurs, but in the same uh, way, they are uh, glad to share the, their knowledge with others, with other generations, and to help them to become better. Thank you so much, Natalia, for your thoughts and for having us. Um, so, in this first panel, we heard about learnings, challenges and needs, about technology and about innovation, about the past, the present and, of course, the future. So now it's time to a pause. Grab a coffee, have a break and come back with us uh, to talk about tourism trends. See you in 10 minutes.
Hello everyone and welcome back to this international forum about education, employment and tourism uh, in the European Union. Uh, we, we will have our second uh, panel uh, in a few minutes about uh, future trends in tourism, but right now um, it will be presented uh, by the European Commission, the Pact of, for Skills, a shared uh, engagement model for skills development in Europe. So I would like to uh, welcome Slavomir Tokarski, Director of Directorate F, Industrial Policy and Innovation of DG Grow. Hello, Slavomir, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, how are you? Welcome. Yeah, fine, thank you. So, um, maybe uh, we can download the... the the presentation and let me maybe start by, by referring to, to what has been said uh, before. I think also by Mr. Medas who said that uh, we used to live uh, with the idea that tourists will grow by itself and that there is no need for a sort of public policy angle, which turned out not to be true. And at the same time, uh, uh, after the crisis, we should not think that tourists can be the same. It will be different. It will have to undergo digital and green transition as uh, uh, any other industrial sector and for the similar reasons because the aspirations of, of, of young generation uh, are different. They will be looking for uh, uh, the tourist experience which is maybe more individual which corresponds to the digital literacy and also corresponds to the idea of, of low carbon tourist experience. So this is a little bit the two angles which can be linked to, uh, uh, to the presentation on Pact for Skills. It's about public policy for skills, public and private. It's about joining forces. At the same time, it's about making tourism different. So triggering a change that will start the transformation. Now, uh, um, if you look at the issue of skills, and if you look at any analysis that is available right now, they are telling you that we in Europe need to train, upskill and reskill something like 120 million people over the next five years. So, so it is huge. If we look at cost, if we combine this figure with the cost, which is around five, 15,000 euros per employee, uh, uh, this is quite a significant challenge. Um, and if we make a comparison to sectors which already concluded, but for skills like automotive, there, for example, the idea is that almost one million workers should be trained, upskilled and reskilled annually. So it's a huge task, but it's an important task. And it is also something which is discerned by, by our, our competitors on the global stage. Uh, both US and China are moving in this direction. This on the week when China announced its massive upskilling and reskilling program over the next five years. Um, and also, uh, if you look at why we should do that, uh, I think there are two reasonings. Uh, uh, at least one of them is maybe not that obvious. I mean, one is clearly economic. It's about competitiveness. It's about companies having access to workers who are well qualified, uh, who are talented, and who can drive this digital and green transition with a proper set of skills. But the other one is also social, in a sense that, that uh, 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 this type of approach is actually addressing the concerns of workers who might fear that they will be left behind by technological progress, uh, who might fear that they will not be able to work with new technologies. So, there is in the uh, in this in this strategy. There is also this issue of the right, almost a social right, to be trained, to be upskilled, so that uh, 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 the workers can have uh, new work careers. They can move uh, in the pyramid of, of in the labor pyramid uh, upwards and do something new, which is linked to digital and green. So this is why uh, uh, we had this idea of launching Pact on Skills. As you can see, this was a flagship action adopted last year. Uh, and in the fact, we already launched the Pact for Skills. We're signing uh, three uh, pacts with three different sectors, microelectronics, automotive, 
Aeronautics and Defense on the 10th of November, together with the German presidency. And the main objective is really to, to connect those uh, efforts, which are, which are all over, everybody's talking about skills, but which are dispersed and we need to be combined in something common in order to reach the critical mass and make this change that is needed. So next slide, please. Now let me tell you a couple of words about uh, what we do and uh, uh, what we can do and uh, uh, for skills and perhaps the, the first point of reference is, is recovery and resilience facility. As you know, this is about money made available to member states in order to, to drive the recovery of the economy. Um, it's uh, um, about the plans uh, that member states are currently preparing according to the instructions by the, by the Commission with milestones, reforms and different investment programs. These plans are supposed to be submitted by April this year and I think most of the member states will submit them in March and they should be implemented by 2026. Now, we, we as a commission, in order to help member states, we propose seven key areas that should be supported. And as you can see, one of those areas was about reskilling and upskilling. And I think this is particularly relevant uh, uh, also for, for two more reasons which are specific for, for, for tourist sector. And one is that uh, uh, it is a good moment actually to develop those, those training schemes, those upskilling and reskilling schemes schemes, uh, 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 particularly now, because uh, um, tourist workers are very often idle, so they have time to, to follow those, uh, uh, those courses, and that could be also the way they could invest a little bit in, in the future. But I think the other, the other issue which should make this model attractive, generally speaking, to the member states is the fact that it increases significantly the absorption capacity but at the same time allows to address the most imminent results of the crisis, that is the increase in the number of unemployed people, because we see that uh, companies are laying off and probably will see more of it in the near future. Um, together with the, with the uh, um, uh, model for upskilling and reskilling, the Commission also proposed a, a number of, of tools that could be actually helpful for the member states in, in doing this. And these are, for example, creation of the legal framework for entitlements for labor market training. Uh, and they take the form of individual learning accounts. So on one hand, this provides a sort of account on which public authorities or private company can, can transfer money that would enable a worker to follow a particular training. On the other hand, it's also a way of appreciating uh, uh, the formal and informal training that a given worker is actually receiving. Then uh, uh, we also uh, uh, delivered a new legal framework for, for vocational education and training, uh, uh, and we are trying to update this, this, this VAT provision to support the digital and green transition. And also we suggest the development of national program of apprenticeship in ICT, including an SME. So these are the ideas for the investment by the member states that could be actually included into this reskilling and upskilling model. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so this is a little bit what packed skills are about. Uh, and I think if I uh, to say it in a, in, a, in a nutshell, they're about shared skills intelligence, so that we all in a, in a given sector or ecosystem, we share the same uh, information and the same vision of what should be done for skills. They're about one strategy, and they're also about roles of public and private sector, which should be complementary, it should be reinforcing each other. What is very important, and I think this is a certain departure from the labor policy that we are having until now, it is that uh, um, um, all this shall be, shall be done and prepared in anticipation of the changes in the labor market. So that uh, uh, we should be screening all the time what is happening in the, in the ecosystem, in tourism, and constantly update our intelligence and constantly and constantly uh, uh, um, provide update our, our upskilling uh, schemes so that uh, uh, the knowledge that is given, the skills are given to workers 
are, are up to time and up to challenge. Um, I think what is also important is that uh, um, what is also important is that the skills pact can take a variety of forms. Uh, so on one hand, we are talking about sort of general commitment of, of all the stakeholders or a, a critical number of stakeholders in a, in a given sector or ecosystem. But on the other hand, we are also talking about national and regional local partnerships. So we can think about a number of tourist regions or, or destinations that are embarking upon new idea, be it uh, low carbon holidays or be it data sharing. And they agree on what needs to be done in the area of skills in order to, to make, it, make it happen. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, what happened in, in, um, in November and what we foresee as a first step for every ecosystem is signing of the charter. And the charter is this vision that should be shared by all the stakeholders who decide to, to join the, the, the pact. Uh, and this charter also should include a first series of commitments, uh, commitments that are expressed in KPIs, in key performance indicators, for example, regarding share of individuals benefiting from reskilling and upskilling, or the number of SMEs to be trained, uh, or the number of people who are socially excluded. Um, so we could think, for example, and this is more or less how it's going to work in the automotive sector about large companies that are committing to, to upskill their old workers and then public authorities, regions or member states are using different sources of funding, for example, to upskill workers in the, in the supply chain. Next slide, please. So what is the, the, the support uh, that we as a commission can, can offer to, to, to those who want to actually join the, the uh, Pact for Skills? Uh, you can see that we'll be setting up in the second half of 2021 three hubs. One will be about networking. Um, the other will be about uh, sharing knowledge. And the third one will be about guidance on access to different sources of funding. Uh, and our ambition would be to create uh, uh, one point of entry so that you are not getting lost in different funding opportunities. I think it's also important uh, uh, to see that we will facilitate the exchange between the PAC and national and regional authorities. So it's not that once we launch the PAC, uh, you will be left alone. We will follow, we will bring in to the table uh, national authorities of the member states who are interested, regional authorities, and we will act as facilitators for the further implementation of the pact. Next slide, please. So this is, I mentioned already, something about, about funding. The most immediate funding comes from REACT EU, which is from the cohesion policy. Uh, uh, but the majority of funding, as we see it, should come in this financial perspective from the new ESF plus and ERDF funds. And uh, I think uh, uh, it is important uh, to know that for the first time ERDF has, uh, 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 can fund actually upskilling. Uh, so uh, it is a sort of short-term upskilling that would accompany quickly industrial transformation. And this makes this uh, alignment between uh, skills policy an industrial policy uh, more easy than was the case until now. You have also just transition fund uh, because uh, the skilling of workers in the regions that are particularly affected by, by green transition uh, is something which is also very high on the, on the agenda, very relevant to many European regions. And tourists could be one of the ways actually to, to find the alternative employment for those workers. And if you have whole component in InvestEU, where there is so-called social investment and skills window that can be used for, for upskilling and, and reskilling. Next slide, please. 
Now, you probably know better than I do uh, how the tourist labor market looks like. Uh, uh, it is not easy and probably it is more complex to launch skills pact in this sector than elsewhere. We do not have, to, we do not have a situation like in, in defense sector or, or aeronautic sector or, or automotive sector where we have a number of big companies that uh, uh, subscribe to the pact and then were quickly followed by, by all the other actors. Here we are talking about the sector which is to much greater extent created by, by SMEs the connections, the, the, the value chains are relatively short, so they are often isolated. Uh, um, and there are only a few companies that count more than 250 employees. So uh, um, it is also uh, often the case that uh, uh, the uh, employment in the tourist sector is perceived as something of lower quality due to low pay, seasonality, high turnover, uh, um, and what have you. So, so uh, it is, as a sector, it is more difficult. It probably requires also more work on our side in order to bring it to this approach that is uh, um, behind the idea of the, of the skills part. Um, also, you see that there is a, a sector. There is also a sector with, with more part-time jobs and temporary contracts with high turnover. Uh, um, whereas, uh, if I look at the, the bright side, uh, uh, there is a certain contradiction of perceptions about tourist professions. So, on the one hand, uh, um, the qualifications from tourists are much appreciated by the other sectors due to the fact that they develop also many transversal skills in demand across occupations, for example, this orientation versus customer, interpersonal, intercultural communication. Uh, but on the other hand, many qualified employees leave tourism uh, uh, and often young school graduates do not wish to enter the sector because uh, they prefer more stable and better paid jobs. So this is also something that could be addressed in the framework of the skills pact. Next slide, please. So, voila, the pact for skills in tourism. Uh, uh, so, that is why we think that this ambitious app and reskilling strategy in tourism will be essential to keep jobs both in the short term, but also uh, in the context of the sustainable recovery and, and green and digital transition. We organized in, in October a European Tourist Convention, which, and this was one of the key messages coming from. From there, uh, uh, on the 29th of October, uh, Commissioners Breton and, and Schmidt hosted uh, the roundtable on the Pact for Skills for the Tourist Ecosystem with, with all the senior representatives from the, from the industry, big and small companies and, and other relevant stakeholders. And I think that during the meeting, there was a sort of general agreement that, that Europe, Europe's tourists is really facing a precedent hardship we made the analysis of different ecosystems. Actually, tourism is the most is the one that was affected negatively most of them. Uh, uh, but at the same time, okay, there is a need to, to for the companies to, to keep the head just above the water. But at the same time, there is also this this paradigm, this this, this necessity of of major structural challenges linked to the competitiveness in the longer term of tourist businesses, adoption of digital tools, uh, um, work with data, um, also better access to the, to the pool of talented people. So this is, these are the, the sort of type of challenges that the skills pact is, is facing, and this is a bit rational for the, for the pact for skills in tourism. Next slide, please. So this is this is it, uh, and just to sum up, uh, 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 you know, Pact for Skills is something about about taking action together. It can take different forms. It can cater for different situations, be it regional, be it national, be it cross border. But I think most importantly, it is about joint effort that should really uh, underpin the, the future of the tourist ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation, Mr. Slavomir. We're going uh, straight forward to our uh, panel, and I would like to invite Natalia Avidik, 
head of st sector for strategic planning and implementation of EU programs and projects uh, from the Ministry of Tourism of Croatia to uh, join the conversation. Hello, Natalia, are you there? Welcome. We're going to wait for um, just a little bit. Natalia. Hello, do you hear me now? Hi, yes, Hello. yes, we, we Hello, can hear you. Everybody. Hello. Okay. I had some uh, technical, at, at one, one moment I didn't see uh, the way to connect, but now it's okay. No problem, welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, it was very interesting presentation uh, we saw uh, about the European, U European Pact for Skills. I would like to uh, share the presentation uh, with you. Let me uh, just to click everything. Yeah, please, uh, at the beginning, maybe it's easier for you to just confirm if you see the presentation. Of course. We can see you. <laughs> right okay, <now>. yes. <laughs> yes, we have the presentation. Thank you. Okay. One moment. Uh, okay. So is everything okay at the, at the beginning? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, we can start. As you all know, uh, tourism is uh, one of the largest sectors of the Croatian economy and the impact of pandemic crisis on tourism and hospitality sector was severe. We see the opportunity of economic recovery in Croatia by supporting tourism sector as it is one of the most important drivers of economic recovery in the post-crisis period. Due to above, it is necessary to increase the sustainability and resilience of Croatian tourism by implementing reforms and activating investments that will positively affect the development of new tourism products, attract new market segments and more even regional distribution of tourism, all in order to reduce seasonality. To boost the recovery of Croatian tourism, it is crucial uh, to adapt businesses to new condition arising, conditions arising, arising from corona crisis, uh, uh, coronavirus crisis using innovative approach and technologies. And in the end, it is of the most uh, importance to prepare human resources to be able to respond to the challenges tourism uh, uh, sector faces. I would like to take this opportunity to present uh, you the key findings from our strategic project uh, uh, called SmartMed project that Croatia is impl implementing together with partners from nine countries in the Mediterranean. Uh, so, one moment, sorry. Uh, our ambition with the strategic project is to influence, influence relevant policies with concrete actions and examples, contributing significantly to the progress of the raised uh, common issues, not only within the partnership of the project, but also throughout the Mediterranean area and even the European Union. The achieved results in coordination with governance platform project, thematic communities and the horizontal project of the same team should feed the debate for the next programming period to become a reference for national and regional programs working on the same subject. The most important output of the uh, development of, uh, uh, of the SmartMed project is the development of common smart SmartMed tourism business model for the Mediterranean area, taking into account common needs of the region for sustainable tourism, collaboration of the model of, uh, to feed the needs uh, of partners, countries, testing of the model through innovative pilot initiatives for reusable results that will be mainstreamed through e-learning platform that, and built into national and EU policies. Um, within the project Smart Med, uh, smart tourism uh, was defined using uh, four key pillars. 
sustainability, cooperation and participation, technologies, and of course, human capital. Uh, all these four areas encompasses a number of key, uh, uh, key areas that, uh, that are analyzed through the project. First output of the project is state-of-the-art analysis of Mediterranean skills and tourism competitiveness. This analysis provides an overview of existing policy strategies and regulatory framework in the Mediterranean countries with an aim to identify main challenges and potential, for example, skill needs, legal barriers, business environment, and, uh, and similar. Um, and uh, the aim of the project is development of business model for smart tourism and in these mentioned areas. Smart made a, a state of the art analysis uh, uh, of med skills and tourism competitiveness is the, let's say, uh, first output of our project and the key areas and the conclusions uh, within uh, the, this analysis uh, uh, are in uh, in uh, areas uh, that needs to be uh, un that that are underdeveloped and needs to be developed. So these areas are supporting innovation in tourism, development of entrepreneurial skills in tourism, and the development of digital skills. And uh, for the conclusion. Results of analysis were discussed with all relevant stakeholders on national level through empowerment events where we agreed on key areas for the development and improvement of tourism competitiveness and innovation in, uh, in the project uh, uh, countries. Uh, so uh, these, these uh, conclusions uh, goes. Uh, human capital and entrepreneur skills in Croatia needs to be developed. There is a lack of consistency of successful measures. Croatia should encourage and develop more creative entrepreneurship, support year-round employment and continuous development of competencies uh, of actors in tourism in accordance with market changes. It is necessary to work on upgrading the competencies of actors in tourism and youth through institutional education, but more, more importantly, through lifelong learning. And uh, the, the most important uh, conclusion in this analysis is that uh, we need to get out of the usual framework uh, uh, for the human resources. Uh, let me uh, say I, I wanted to make a short presentation as an introduction to our panel and uh, present you uh, the results uh, of uh, outputs in our SmartMed project and of, of course to promote uh, this project as we see uh, SmartMed project and, uh, as one of important strategic projects for, for uh, European Union countries on the Mediterranean to support the development of human resources in tourism and, and of course, uh, all other PRs that are important for tourism competitiveness. So uh, I think uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, I could conclude with the presentation, give the floor to my colleagues and then we can uh, discuss on uh, this important topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. We have time. Um, we have time later to to share some more thoughts and, of course, to 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 um, hear uh, from the public, from the the people who are watching this, uh, some questions uh, from them. So um, our next uh, guest is Tanya Ang uh, Anglitzaner. Uh, Sagadan, Director of uh, at Vocational, Vocational College of Hospitality and Tourism Maribor. Hello, Tanya. Are you there? Welcome. Good afternoon, absolutely. Hello to Portugal. Yes, Tanya, Anglitzer Sagadan, a little bit difficult to um, pronounce. It is. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's German. So let me just share my presentation with you.
Okay, so um, I'll today talk a little bit about the upcoming challenges for educators, while at the same time trying to incorporate some of the thoughts that we've been listening to since this morning. I'll start with the European Travel Commission that's in the report published at the end of the year 2020, we know the numbers, we can see them, said, of course, that the path to recovery will be slow. But what is important for us educators is that we'll also need to reshape this reassessment of tourism KPIs, work together with the ministries and public institutions on working out new tourism policies, and of course, providing the stronger commitments. I'm glad that Portugal is already providing this stronger commitment in your presidency program, where you, on one hand, um, emphasize education and use, and on the other hand, focus on tourism and competitiveness. What is important for us educators in your program is that promoting this broadening of higher education, higher education and base it to new segments through acquisition of new skills, upgrade of existing skills, adult learning, and the importance of strengthening the higher education networks with a strong focus on European university alliances. So today I'm here not only representing Slovenia and Vocational College of Hospitality and Tourism, but also speaking in the name of the European Association of Hospitality and Tourism Schools, AEHD, uh, to show this stronger commitment and the importance of higher education networks. In, June, in September last year, just shortly before the second lockdown, Model University Vienna organized a virtual seminar and they said that the COVID crisis also created many opportunities for the travel tourism sector. And that's something that was emphasized by Mr. Thierry Breton, the EU commissioner, in his opening speech, so that the crisis is accelerator of transformation. And this is what we educators will have to focus on in the future as well. Now, at the moment, 27% of all destinations worldwide keep their borders closed. And we know that EU tourism trends and predictions say short haul might recover in two years, long haul in four years, but it's the domestic tourism that will be at the forefront of development, training, and activities for the next two years. So it is up to us educators to not only focus on existing students and the future students, but also help and support the SMEs, the, the, the market, local regional providers, small tourist farms, wine producers, and all of the other ones who are mostly uh, affected by these COVID measures and help them reskill and upskill and find new solutions for further development. And that was also something suggested by uh, your uh, Minister of Economy, Mr. Pedro Sousa Vieira, at the beginning. Going back to education, the Sustainable Development uh, Agenda 2030 has education in Chapter 4, and they talk about acting together for education. So for us, this is now the time to prepare the young ones, the young learners for future challenges. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't think that people know the numbers that are behind it. So do you have an idea of how many young learners have been affected by COVID because of closure of schools? I have some UNESCO data here. And in the first lockdown towards the end, mid-May, there were 1.6 billion young learners who had either no access or limited access to regular schools. Half a billion learned in a hybrid way and 1.1 billion learners learned only through distance learning. Last week, the situation is not really much, much better. We still have 1 billion young learners who are affected by it. We have 34 countrywide closures and we have about 390 uh, million young learners who still learn from home and Slovenia is among them. So for us, vocational educators, this is a very important message and a very, uh, because our schools are, our students are suffering most. Now, our students, for example, have about 40 to 45 percent of their educational content in a practical life environment, in specialized laboratories, not to speak of the fact that they need to do three months of training 
at least in the hospitality industry. Uh, with these numbers, it's of course a difficult situation. Slovenia is a small country. We have 2 million people. And last year we had 76,000 students out of which 11,500 in vocational two-year short cycle programs. So we're talking about age groups 19 plus. And this is also the college that I represent, two-year short course program, one in hospitality management, the other one in wellness. We had about 65,000 students enrolled in other study programs from bachelor to PhD. But for 2 million people in Slovenia, there are 95 higher education institutions, 48 vocational colleges, six universities and 41 private faculties, institutes and academies. And 16 of us offer hospitality and tourism programs, either as independent programs or as part of the business studies. So the hospitality situation in Slovenia hasn't really helped our learners. We had our first lockdown that lasted about three months last year. March 15th, end of May, early June. And this means that our students were home, learning from home, and our businesses were closed. So they had no chance to even do their practical work. The second lockdown started on October 18th. We are still in the middle of it. The schools are still closed. Uh, either, uh, however, the elementary education might start next week, but we're not yet 100% sure. So for the hospitality students, for the last 10 months, they've been at home, studying from home for six months. And in the summer, when businesses were open, they had two and a half summer months of summer vacation. It is a very challenging situation, especially if we take into consideration the fact that out of the unemployment numbers, about 12,800 in Slovenia are or fall into the field of hospitality. And what's happening with them? How do we get them back once tourism recovers? That will be the challenge for all of us, not just the educators. Now, the Slovenian Tourism Organization has been working really, really hard for the last 15 years to bring the image of Slovenia up to where it is now, to create this idea of Eiffel Slovenia, boutique, five-star, exclusive, uh, green destination, healthy destination. And we've also been working on the workforce of the staff. However, with all this stuff, numbers being down now, it will be very difficult to, to go back and to support the activities and the situations we're in. Last year, um, Michelin Guide had the first edition. 52 restaurants in Slovenia were awarded with some Michelin either stars or plates. And our school restaurant, Restaurant 7, received a Michelin plate. Since two weeks ago, we've been European region of gastronomy, but hospitality businesses are down. A few days ago, Condé Nast Traveler positioned Slovenia as number one must-see destination in the year 2021. We don't know when everything will recover. So the upcoming challenges for us are not only uh, on, on, get, on opening up the schools, but also thinking about how to empower the unemployed students who are back home, perhaps a little bit less motivated, and how to bring them back, give them back the interest for the hospitality industry. We need to focus on domestic issues. We need to focus on domestic uh, tourism for the next few years. But again, here we are in a challenging situation because the young people born in the years 2002 and 2003 who will enter universities and higher education institutions from next year on, are the smallest generation, demographically speaking, in independent Slovenia. So not only do we have 95 higher education institutions, all of us will be fighting for 17,500 pupils and also fighting opening up of the hospitality industry and raising their interests. Hospitality industry will probably remain closed for a few more months. So we hope spring, but we don't know if this is April, May or June. So this will probably coincide with getting the students back for laboratory work, for, for skills and for everything that we need to give them before we can send them out into the working environment. So these demographic uh, indexes do not really talk in favor of, of for us but what we need to know now is reset rethink the whole thing 
And we heard the Secretary General of the United Nations World Travel Organization who said more competitive and sustainable approach towards tourism destinations and education. We heard Mr. Miguel Cabrita, the Deputy Minister of Labor and Vocational Training of Portugal, who said you need to invest in upskilling, reskilling, and innovation. And that was also emphasized by uh, Peter Haxton and a few of the other speakers earlier on. Uh, we heard a lot about digital context, including that, showing high flexibility, not only of existing study programs, but high flexibility of our approach. We need to include change management, and that was emphasized by the TUI group and the core group. We need to work on creativity of the young people. Uh, we just need to continue forming these international networks, teach students about versatile communication skills, especially soft skills, which was also emphasized by, uh, uh, by the Dean of Porto Business School. And uh, social networks and digital marketing will play a very, very important role also for us educators in the future. So the question now is how soon will we be ready for that? Because I don't really believe we are ready for that now. So thank you very much and more obrigada. Back to you, Mariana. Thank you, Tanya, so much for your presentation. Our next guest is the Director of Development of OSCO's International School and Association Partnership Development. Please welcome John Lohr. Hello, John. Are you there? I am here. Hello, <laughs> Portugal. Hello, Hello, Europe. Hello, world. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Can you hear me just fine? Yes. Excellent. Now let's check if the screen sharing is working. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see. Let's roll. So, like I said, it's a pleasure to be here today to have the opportunity to speak to you and to share a bit of our data and vision for 2021 and the opportunities and challenges that we feel it will bring. Um, before I also start, I want to say a special thank you to Tourism Portugal and especially Ms. Ana Paula Pace for the kind invitation. So, I am John Lord, Director of Development for HOSCO, where I've been responsible for establishing global partnerships with hospitality schools and associations for the last five plus years. In case you don't know about HOSCO, we are the world's largest hospitality network. We were born in Switzerland in 2011 with one clear vision, to empower the hospitality industry by uniting all of its professionals, education centers, and employers on one global network. So HOSCO platform currently connects 1.5 million hospitality talents and professionals, 400 plus schools, and 7,500 plus world-class companies around the globe. If you're an employer, you use HOSCO to find and hire the best hospitality talents in the most efficient way. If you're a talent, you join HOSCO to access thousands of jobs, connections, and advice, and to belong to a global hospitality-specific community. And if you're a school, you partner with HOSCO to expand your international internships and jobs, and also to perhaps power your career and alumni platforms. So given that, today, I would like to share with you some perspectives and insights which we have gathered from our hospitality talents, employers, and schools on HOSCO regarding what the future holds and also demonstrate to you some of the actions we have taken to meet the demands of 2021 and beyond. So let's talk about 2020, or rather, let's not. I think we can all agree 2020 was science fiction for the hospitality industry. Never before has the industry seen such a drop in tourism activities as indicated here by this UNWTO data. This in turn had dire effects on the hospitality talents, employers, and schools. But already in 2021, we have had sufficient reason to believe that the hospitality industry will recover and to be optimistic. Number one, predictions show recovery on tourism arrivals, although at different velocities, again seen here in the UNWTO data. Number two, we all know vaccines are rolling out worldwide. Number three, key markets are recovering, specifically the Middle East and Asia. And number four, from our perspective at HOSCO, our research indicates that the industry is starting to hire as employers are starting to post jobs on various platforms such as HOSCO. On our network, the top 10 departments with the most job openings are sales and marketing, F&B kitchen, F&B service, management, housekeeping, and front office. In the top eight active job categories that were opened on HOSCO and published in the past three months are cooks, spa and wellness, housekeeping, 
server, guest relation, sales, and bartender. So simply said, if employers are starting to post jobs, they're also starting to hire. So in our opinion, the question is not when will the recovery come, but rather how will we deal with the pending talent shortage? It was already the case before, and now that many skilled professionals have turned away to other sectors during the crisis, the skills shortage might be even wider once the industry gets back on its feet. So in anticipation of the recovery phase, the coming talent shortage, and the needs of our talents, schools, and employers, we have taken the following actions. For example, in 2019, over 79% of hospital members responded to a survey which indicated a strong interest in starting a personal development plan in the next 12 months. Understanding that continued learning is a key need for our members, and this has also been echoed by many speakers today, we have partnered with some of the leading course creators and providers to give our members upskilling and ways to retain their talents and build new talents. We've done this by launching our hospital course directory, which currently features courses on hospitality skills, but also hard, soft, and business skills. And these are sourced from some of the most respected providers around the world. So results of our hospitality pulse and employer sentiment survey conducted in 2019 to our employers showed that when the recovery comes, the ability to hire talents even more quickly and efficiently will be higher than ever before. So considering this, and that talents will be investing more in micro courses and skill builders, we are also joining the movement to make skills visible. And we're doing this by partnering with two major groups, City and Guilds, a global leader in hospitality skills development, and Credly, an end-to-end -end solution for creating, issuing, and managing digital credentials. The idea here is to bring the world of digital badges and certifications to our platform, to our partners, and to our employers. Digital badges will allow Hosco talents and any talent to showcase their certified skills and employers, therefore, to search for those skills and better match job offers to talents. And speaking of digital skills, once again, this has been reflected in today's discussion. We also feel that digital skills will start to permeate the hospitality education and training sectors. And we see the most important digital hard hospitality skills we focused on coding, data analytics, social media management, digital marketing, content creation, and SEO. And for all the hospitality skills associations and groups listening right now, if you're not offering these kind of programs, look into it. These are going to be in high demand from young people entering our industry and from industry employers themselves. And for schools, after reaching out to over 100 of our key school partners, many indicated a strong need for better online learning materials. So in response, we partnered with Lobster Inc. to make their online industry training courses available to education institutes and associations for the very first time. If you don't know about Lobster Inc., for over 20 years, they've been helping the world's major corporate brands such as Marriott, Hilton, Accor, Kempinski Hotels, and more to train their internal staff through their online learning platform and their content. Over 1 million registered learners across 140 countries are currently utilizing Lobster Inc. programs. But now, schools can adopt the Lobster Inc. courses and content to support their current and long-term online learning strategies. But they can also do it to supplement internships and experiential learning requirements, which, because of the pandemic, have been either delayed or greatly disrupted. And they can also adopt this turnkey content to build their own micro-courses and certifications. In addition, we're talking to a couple, we're also trying to make Lobster Inc. available to national association groups and associations to support the retraining and hiring needs of smaller businesses and their employees. On Lobster Inc., you find 180 online courses composed of 1,570 micro lessons, totaling 200 plus hours of learning in all areas of hospitality. So once again, our goal is to be the conduit of Lobster Inc into the hospitality schools and into the hospitality associations of the world to equip the students, to equip the talents, and to equip the SME businesses. Finally, the pandemic has shown that hospitality learning can happen anywhere, but with this has come a challenge to the traditional model of hospitality education. Many schools indicated the coming recruitment crisis. I think what Tanya mentioned earlier illustrates that. There's a lot of schools in Slovenia, but not enough students to fill them. So, more, so now more than ever, it's important for schools to adopt permanent blended learning formats that will allow a school to greatly expand its online 
student programs, but also maintain its current on-site programs. But to drive these programs, schools need students. So anticipating this, we launched our own education marketing solutions, which allows a school to list their program on our new course directory and also launch campaigns targeted at specific segments of our hospital, hospital community, providing our members with relevant education opportunities and schools with qualified student leads. So overall, we believe there's a lot of reasons to be feel positive about 2021. Yet, we must not forget that the mise en place measures that hospitality talents, employers, and schools take in these waning months of the pandemic will dictate their success and ultimately contribute to the hospitality industry's recovery. So our advice to hospitality talents, schools, employers, associations out there are number one, embrace upskilling, training, and digital credentials as the new normal. Number two, equip and hire talents based not only on their education, but their visible, certifiable skills. And number three, embrace the best practice of the industry via digital learning and adopt permanent blended learning environments. Hope you enjoyed this short presentation, gained a bit of knowledge on our network insights and company actions. If you have any questions, please reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, for your presentation. Uh, our next uh, guest is Annabella Silva, partner from People Advis Advisory Services from EUI. Welcome, Annabella. Hello. Hello, good morning. Hi. I hope you are hearing me well and seeing me as well. Yes, we can see you. Thank you. Great. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. When you are seeing it, please uh, let me know. Yeah, we, we can see it. Can you see it? Yes. Let me just put the full presentation. Okay, great. I hope you are seeing now in uh, full screen. Yes. So, first of all, thank you. I would like to thank uh, Tourism Portugal for the invitation to join uh, this uh, roundtable and uh, to give a warm welcome to the other members of the panel and to the participants in this forum. I hope you are all safe uh, and healthy. Um, tourism has been, as we have been discussing uh, extensively today, one of the sectors most heavily affected by COVID-19. Uh, and the pandemic has, in fact, accelerated some of the trends that were already shaping the, the face of tourism. Um, one of these trends, uh, as we also heard uh, this morning, uh, is in fact uh, technology and digital. So, sorry about that because I don't know what is happening. Let me see. Are you seeing the, the presentation? No. We see a black screen. Yes, I don't know what is happening. Sorry about that. Let can you change can. the slide if it's possible to see if there there's if it's a, a, a problem with this slide or with yeah, all, let me check. all them? Okay. The first now one, you're seeing? Yeah, the first one is ah uh, yeah. Yeah, we can see okay, it now. Great. Great. So um I have prepared this slide with uh, uh, the buzzwords that we hear in the trends shaping the face of tourism. But I prepared yesterday, but I could in fact prepare just hearing uh, all the speeches and all the, the um, panelists that were discussing this morning. Because in fact, um, technology is uh, and digital uh, are a very important trend, current trend and future trend uh, in tourism. What we see is um, uh, customers and consumers um, driving the technology, for example, to use online and mobile platforms uh, for recommendation, travel inspirations, even to reduce currently the physical inter interactions during travel. We also see companies using uh, business and data analytics to increase the consumer knowledge um, and also to um, uh, customize travel experience. Cybersecurity is becoming also more important, particular as remote work has become um, most extensively used due to the COVID-19, and identities are also being digitalized. Automation will change the nature of the work, the job positions, and the skill sets that are going to be required for human employees. On top of this technology trend, we also see other trends that we discussed today. The health and safety are becoming paramount in this new era, but we always uh, also need to rethink tourism 
uh, through the um, sustainability lens. Uh, another uh, point that is important to, uh, to note is that tourism business will also develop local partnerships to design authentic experiences, as we all know that uh, this will be an increasing expectation by travelers or even offer these um, experiences virtually, if that is possible, of course. This crisis has also shown the need for a multi-skilled, technology-enabled um, workforce in the tourism business. Uh, moreover, it has also created an opportunity, in some cases, to hire um, uh, remote, uh, remote workers uh, abroad. So now the work for talent is not only local, but is also global. Business will need to target a, a diverse skill set among employees to plan for workforce continuity um, and reallocation in case of future disruptions. Investment in digitally upskilling the workforce, cross-training employees in a wide number of, of topics, uh, retaining and attracting digital talent will be the key for the, the success of the tourism business, as we have also been talking. I would like to spend a couple of more time just to uh, talk about innovation and digitalization because I know that this has been um, a, a trend already affecting tourism, uh, but the COVID-19 has in fact acted as a catalyst uh, for uh, bringing new technologies and integrating new technologies. Uh, just uh, as a, a note, according to a study from uh, Oliver Wyman and the World Travel and Tourism Council, um, we have some interesting um, uh, uh, statistics to share. For example, 69% of people uh, used video conference for the first time during COVID-19. 44% of travelers said that they now spend more time browsing on social media. 66% of consumers um, are using less cash and more contact, contactless payments. So what we see is, in fact, a digital adoption and consumption are rising. Um, there is an acceleration to move to, to touchless and new te technologies are emerging with the existing technologies and uh, as well as with the physical world. So, for example, we talk about wearables, we talk about virtual reality, augmented uh, reality, just to name a few. And advances, of course, in automation through robotics, machine learning and artificial intelligence are going to disrupt the market, the labor market. In this uh, uh, impact on, on innovation and digitalization, what will this mean for the workforce in the tourism business? Digital transformation will imply an increased demand uh, for employees with a digital and technical skill set, even though, of course, people and soft skills will remain uh, still critical for the tourism business. Higher education institutions will need um, to respond to the technological challenge. And they are already, of course, as we have seen in the presentations before, um, thinking and acting uh, on it. Curricula will need to incorporate um, technological uh, competencies, for example. Universities could offer robotics, artificial intelligence model uh, in the training uh, for tourism and, and um, hospitality programs. Also, companies will need and are also now, uh, we heard Accor, we heard too, um, investing in upskilling and reskilling their own employees, offering online courses on topics such as uh, business and data analytics, innovation, coding, web development, social media. Uh, these are all the topics that are interesting. And employees, they will also need to invest on their own uh, upskilling programs. Not in many cases, what we are seeing is that not in the full certification programs, but for example, um, on um, skill-linked courses, so on short programs such as uh, John was uh, discussing before. Besides this innovation and digitalization, um, another trend that is important has a, a wider impact in the, the workforce in tourism business is the change in demands of, of travel, the evolution of the demand. What we saw in, in COVID-19 is that the pandemic has changed traveler inclination behaviors. Uh, and, and in fact, the tourist business in the past has always been able to follow and to, in many cases, anticipate some, some trends. Um, currently, the various travel restrictions, the fact that some people have concerns about traveling, um, have gave room to the rise of the domestic and regional travel. Uh, as we all uh, discussed also this morning, the international travel will take some time to recover. 
In these uncertain times, a flexible working arrangement uh, will likely be extended to cope with ambiguity in demand and also with the need uh, to temporarily reallocate people to higher uh, demand functions or regions in order to minimize gaps once the, the, the business returns to, to normal. Looking ahead, um, the workforce will need to be more flexible, uh, potentially working across functions and regions, and this will mean a um, higher need for cross-training. So as the sector uh, moves towards uh, re uh, recovery, training and educational resources will be needed to put in place to facilitate upskilling and create a more resilient workforce. Among others, the public and the private sectors should focus on digital skills as well as soft skills. We heard this morning and soft skills such as critical thinking, problem solving, um, communication, creativity, agility will be very important to deal with these changing demands. Also change management has been um, mentioned and it is also an, a very important. And one very important aspect to consider is the, the sense of urgency in the change of the workforce skill set. As the future of work is in fact now, and it is up to all the stakeholders to make this change happen. And to end this presentation with a call for action, I would invite you all to watch uh, a video. So if we can watch please the video. Thank you, Mariana. And now over to you. I don't know if you have available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Annabella, so much for your presentation. We're going to have uh, now like um, 10 minutes um, to, to discuss these issues, to discuss this, uh, this, uh, your topics. And I would like to, to, um, to start with Slavomir Tokarski. Uh, um, and to ask him about how can training and education institutionals uh, fulfill the green and digital ambitions for the, the Pact for Skills that you presented today. Yes, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you for this question. I think uh, <clears throat> I also mentioned during the presentation that what we are trying to do is to update the profile of DET uh, in a sense of giving a greater underpinning to green and digital transition. And uh, this is also about taxonomy of jobs because we, when we'll be talking in the future about, well, tourist operator working with artificial intelligence or, or agile and circular economy, we must have a clear orientation and, and what, is, what is about and what type of, of skills this type of profile does uh, given job uh, uh, enhances. And uh, I think also something which is uh, sometimes uh, not uh, appreciated properly is that uh, uh, also we need to look at the tourism uh, training that is, well, training more generally upskilling and reskilling that is provided by the industry itself. We see many examples, and I think we heard about them today, and, and very often these uh, trainings could be a source of inspiration because they develop it in a close uh, relationship with the workers and often they are very relevant to, and again to emphasize, uh, uh, we are talking about upskilling and reskilling uh, so that people can take up new tasks or new jobs that are due to digital and, and green transformation. So this is something that should be kept in, in mind. And, uh, and this is also something that we'll be trying to, to further develop and assist 
VET through the structure of three hubs that we're going to set up uh, in the second half of the year. So in this sense, uh, uh, since this is nothing curved in stone now, uh, we would also be, I was very curious to, to, to listen and to hear to your ideas because we can still integrate them into this supportive structure that we are going to develop. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Natalia, you, you've talked about uh, cooperation and is, how cooperation is key to the development uh, of these new skills. Uh, how have you been corp uh, cooperating with your neighbor uh, neighborhood um, countries concerning tourism human resources qualification? How, uh, are you working together? Natalia, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm just speaking without unmuting, sorry. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as, as you saw from the presentation, uh, we uh, in, in um, we have um, uh, actually a smart map project with nine countries, nine European countries uh, uh, involved. Uh, so, basically, what we are doing uh, now, and uh, it's an ongoing pr project, uh, but uh, we are definitely uh, developing a business model, taking into consideration problems arise also from from the, uh, this corona uh, uh, virus crisis and also the trends in uh, tourism that needs to be uh, supported in the development of human resources. So we definitely work together and we hope uh, that uh, we will develop, uh, let's say, um, a business model uh, for a human capital, for human resources that we, uh, and, uh, that we will take uh, all the challenges in in the, in the European countries uh, uh, regarding uh, the human uh, resources and uh, we hope that we will find a solution and uh, approach uh, that will uh, fit all and of course uh, to react uh, as quickly as possible and because uh, we all see that uh, action needs to be uh, done uh, uh, very quickly. So this is also important. Uh, it's it, uh, together with the SmartMed project, we have an um, initiative in Croatia. Uh, uh, we, uh, is, uh, we have um, six uh, competence centers for uh, human resources development in tourism. They, uh, or they are all working in uh, different areas uh, of human resources in tourism. And we have a very good uh, connection and cooperation with uh, other um, education and competence centers throughout the Europe. So, for example, our Dubrovnik competence center have a great uh, cooperation with uh, Basque culinary center in San Sebastian. So, uh, we are now uh, seeing uh, the possibility to work together and to to share uh, knowledge and uh, to to answer all these uh, challenges that are ahead of us. Uh, uh, together. So I think we work together uh, definitely on, a, on this matter. Thank you so much. Uh, Tania, uh, Slovenia uh, has participated in this uh, initiative Pact for Skills. How was the experience to, to help to, to coordinate this work? Well, the Pact for Skills project is one of the flagship initiatives under the European Skills Agenda, and Slovenia participated very actively in a few of the actions. Um, what was the, the emphasis on at the beginning was that in a lot of the countries, the potential of vocational education hasn't been fully explored yet. I'm not talking so much about vocational schools for age groups between 18 and nine, uh, 15 and 19, but mostly about vocational colleges, these two, uh, two year short programs. Uh, just for information or illustration, graduates of vocational colleges can in Slovenia earn 40% higher salary than bachelor degree graduates. So there is an important fact that we should discover and really emphasize our efforts on because I think that vocational education has been largely neglected in a lot of different policies. Um, we were coordinators or, or worked together on the European Skills Week that took place uh, in, the, in early November 
And what was emphasized there was uh, we need a fresh approach to vocational training to make it more modern, more attractive, flexible, and as we saw today, digitally fit for the digital age. So we need to boost the digital skills as well. But some of the smaller projects that Slovenia took over, the Association of Higher Vocational Colleges in coordination with Eurasia, Eurasia so this European agency, um, is mentor trained because not only do we need to train and teach our students, but we need to train our mentors in the hospitality environment as well. So there are two projects relatively important for that, mentor train and apprenticeship track. So these two have been at the forefront of the activities in Slovenia. Thank you. John, uh, you talked about the, the effects of the COVID pandemic. What are the future trends in the sector? Yeah. So are you relating to schools, talents or employers? Because each one's a little bit different. Um, but I think as we've discussed pretty uh, detail today is for the schools, mm -hmm. they need to adopt a permanent blended learning solution. Um, and that's also makes sense for the schools. Think about, and you probably maybe heard of it, you know, these Harvard online courses or MIT online courses you can make, you can take. One of the reasons people take it is because of the quality. The other reason is because of the brand. So I think a big trend in future uh, education after COVID is going to be brand driving education interests as well as content. And that's why the schools need to move fast to get their brands out into the digital world instead of just the on-site world, yeah? From the employer perspective, I mean, I think everyone agrees that when this thing comes, we need people and we need people fast. And so they won't have patience and time for someone to get a four-year degree or a, uh, even a one-year degree. They're going to want quick upskilling. So the trend is who's going to offer it. What I've seen talking to a lot of the school, schools is some are trying to move into that space of being a training provider to B2B and SMEs. And others are relying more on like local uh, regional groups who, who already provide vocational training. But the schools want in because they see another way to bring their brand closer to the industry. In my experience, and Tanya can probably echo this, in all these conferences and organizations we've been part of, there's always a discussion of the gap between industry and academia. But we have the best example ever to bridge the gap, which is solving the solution for the manpower crisis. And from a talent perspective, it's going to be being visible. There's going to be a lot of challenges and a lot of demand and a lot of people applying for a lot of jobs. So the more they can stand out, the better. And that's through the micro courses and making it visible. In our case, what we mentioned, the badging. Thank you, John. Annabella, um, we talked about uh, human beings, but we talked about technology also. We, we keep going and talking about artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, in your opinion, can employment in tourism ecosystem be at danger with these trends? Uh, well, introduction of uh, automation technologies, which includes, but it's not limited to robotics, raises, in, in fact, in some people, concern of job losses um, and uh, technological unemployment due to the replacement of humans by, by robots or uh, by other um, automation technologies. However, it's all, there is always two sides of uh, one coin, um, which means that automation can also have a positive impact for creating value for customers uh, and shareholders for improving health, improving uh, well-being, quality of life. Uh, the impact of automation in uh, jobs in tourism is not as straightforward because um, there is, um, uh, first of all, tourism services are heterogeneous, so if I can have uh, um, one process that can be implemented in, man in many different ways in different companies. Um, also, there is the, the human element uh, to it, which is usually in, um, in tourism. Uh, there is the need for empathy, for communication, and in those type of activities, in many cases, it's difficult to be to be automated. Uh, secondly, uh, and, and third, in uh, in tourism businesses, there are also processes that are very different. You have the front end processes, you have the back office, and the front end, as we mentioned, are um, more difficult to to automate. So. In the, in, the, in the net um, um, calculation, the impact on, of, autom of automation in uh, tourism will depend on the balance between two factors, the replacement factor and the enhancement factor. So if we are talking about um, low value activities that can be automated, and that uh, will be the most uh, um, uh, significant effect, in fact, we will have a negative impact on, on jobs. 
if you can have an enhancement and use automation and technology uh, to build the capacity in tourism, uh, then you will have a positive effect. Um, independently from the different views you may have on subjects, um, in fact, there will be a, a change in the in the nature of the work, um, and this will also imply new managerial skill sets. So the leadership will also have to adjust in order to reorganize uh, operational processes and uh, to overcome some resistance by customers and employees. So in a nutshell, um, automation can be can have can bring a lot of positive aspects. Uh, there are also some concerns that need to be addressed, uh, but this is why education and learning will have a, a, a very important role to play in this, in this uh, area. Thank you, Annabella. Thank you for all our guests that uh, stayed with us this morning. Thank you mostly to you to, for watching us. Uh, to close this forum, I would like to welcome Rita Marques, Portuguese uh, Tourism Secretary of State. Uh, for this side, take care, stay home and be safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariana. Um, dear European Commissioner of the, um, for the EU Single Market, uh, dear Thierry Breton, uh, dear Secretary General of the UNWTO, uh, dear Zurab Pololi Kasvili, um, dear colleagues, Minister of State and for the Economy and Digital Transition, um, Pedro Cisa Vieira, and uh, Deputy Minister of Labor and Vocational Training, uh, Miguel Cabrita. First, I would like to, th uh, to thank all the speakers and, of course, the moderator for their insightful uh, discussion, enlightening discussion. I also like to extend a warm thank you uh, to all of you, to all of you that attended this event. Uh, as we all know, Portugal has taken the presidency of the Council of the European Union at an extremely difficult moment with this pandemic. Our main mission is to work towards strengthen Europe's, uh, Europe's resilience. Uh, that's why we presented our five key um, priorities for the EU. Um, resilient, green, uh, digital, social and global. Uh, within this um, axis, it will be our priority uh, the implementation of measures aimed at a robust recovery of European economies as advocated by the roadmap for recovery. And to respond to the social and human dimension of this crisis in a flexible, agile and inclusive way. We are now facing a new lockdown and fighting hard to contain the pandemic across Europe and across the world. Once again, the Europe, the EU, must improve its inner articulation in order to avoid sudden decisions on border controls, different quarantine requirements, harmonizing recognition of tests, and take advantage of the benefits of the ongoing vaccination process. Like we did last spring, uh, we still believe that deeper and effective coordination um, in EU would offer clarity and predictability uh, to all stakeholders and citizens and promote confidence in consumers. With the high pandemic numbers we are facing now across Europe, our main efforts will be on cohesion and an even greater communication uh, and coordination with public and private efforts or aligned. Massive use of technology, of course, to maintain saf safety and on the medium term, uh, increase training and education towards a new and different future, a better future after this pandemic. We are aware of the competitiveness uh, numbers and the competences defined in EU treaties for tourism, but tourism touches such numerous critical aspects within the EU competence, like EU single market, uh, digital single market, uh, competition, free movement of people, uh, mobility, financing, um, uh, that it con uh, cannot be seen as an outside uh, subject. I'm also convinced that tourism ecosystem will play a key role to accelerate Europe's economic recovery with strong inputs to the European Green Deal and digital agenda in order to consolidate its position as the world leader in tourism. Uh, 
In this context, it is clear that recovery of the tourism industry must necessarily uh, be supported, financially supported, given the serious situation and major lo job losses in the sector and its implication to other sectors and the, uh, to all the economy. To this end, uh, we must create the conditions so that the next generation EU package can be on side of tourism, can be on side of tourism companies and help them to maintain jobs and remain competitive in a very new, dynamic and changing environment. Having said this, I would like to tell you a little bit about the motivation behind this forum. Uh, when we started thinking about the events of the Portuguese presidency, we immediately identified the need to look at qualification uh, in tourism. In fact, as all professionals, uh, as all professions, qualifications and training are essential for high quality performance. And truth to, be, um, truth to be told, there is no good tourism without good professionals. However, being a tourism professional today, I, um, in, a, in a very demanding uh, times, I, um, a computer, I, I am a computer engineer graduate and so I immediately identified the challenge of digitalization in tourism. We live in an area, uh, an era of digital transformation in which tourism, as one of the transversal sectors of the economy, has been in a central character. Segmenting, testing on business intelligence, uh, planning, uh, reacting in a timely manner uh, are fundamental strategies across the all activities, including tourism. And since everything starts with education and training, it's crucial to increase the training of the sector's workforce in a digital economy at all levels, from top management to operational management. I believe it is the only way to enable companies to transition and to give talents a long-term career perspective. Also, one of the lessons of this pandemic is that we need to be able to adapt to change and to sector needs, namely by investing in a lifelong learning process and in the upskilling and reskilling workforce in the sector. After listening uh, to the Commission's presentation on the Pact for Skills and interesting panel and debate that follow it, I cannot help to feel we are on the same page. We have the same goals, and we now have an opportunity to rethink and strengthen our strategic approach on education and training in tourism. We fully agree with the Commission and its main vectors in the Pact uh, for Skills. That is fundamental to promote a culture of lifelong learning for all, uh, to build strong skills partnerships, to monitor skills supply demand, not anticipating and anticipating skills needs. Summarizing what has been said, networking, knowledge, guidance, finding partners, promoting uh, cooperation, encouraging the participation in webinars, peer learning activities, sharing best practices, involving companies in the skill and reskilling process. All of this is important. We aim at a resilient recovery and wish to provide future generations with the opportunity to uh, thrive and we must maintain ambitious goals regarding green and digital transformations. In order to respond to the challenge that the tourism ecosystem faces, we need totally different qualification models, much more agile, much more flexible, that work in cooperation, bringing together different levels of education, effectively involving academia and businesses. For instance, creating courses in a business context. So, um, as it, is, it has, uh, it has be, uh, all been said, EU funding, EU funding, Europe funding is more than crucial. It is imperative. It is imperative. I will highlight the recovery and resilience facility, as well as the multi-annual financial framework 21-27 and its relevant funding instruments as a means to support this transition and to help to implement the pact for skills that has already been presented. Thank you.
We need to stimulate innovation in the education and training sector, and the existence of EU funding for this purpose is essential. But companies must be aware and know where to seek, what is eligible, what is not, and how to apply. And since the majority of businesses are SMEs, small and medium enterprise, enterprises, we need a simple guide to assess information on relevant EU funding. We need guidance to identify financial possibilities. There must be a transparent exchange between the Commission and the Member States, like the one we have here today. We need to promote access to financing. We must promote new approaches as well. Cooperative projects, uniting different entities, including schools, training centers, universities, businesses, stimulating the need for cooperation and dissemination of good practices. We also must promote investment in technologies, digital, multimedia, uh, training and education in a digital way, in order to ensure the technology preparation of schools and universities for the digital era, transformation of education in general, whether it's in a classroom or in a distance uh, learning environment. For this purpose, it is also essential to review external funding rules, introducing new terms, new conditions, funding uh, new rules, since the ones existing have been designed for face-to-face -face training models, therefore not adequate and may affect the quality and sustainability of distance education and training programs. The new multi-annual financial framework should have instruments for this purpose, including programs to support not only training in its different models, in person or in distance, but also to support innovation, digital technology, organizations and new processes. Review the models for creating and operating courses, both in the field of training and education, which are more agile and flexible, capable of responding to the effective needs of the sector. So, we need to restructure the normative and guidance framework for distance education and training, valuing this type of education as a factor of inclusion and reinforcing accessibility to education and training to a bigger number of people. In my opinion, before we start new courses and new models, we should develop studies to assess employability in the sector, how, um, what, will work, uh, what will workforce look like in the future? What professionals will have in the future? What type of professionals are needed? In what areas? In what quantities? It is crucial to assess and to identify the necessary future skills, the characteristics of the professionals we currently have in the sector and the evolution we need that those professionals are going to be useful to all of us. The need to create a training program for trainers and teachers, which unites the sector of training and education, also is very important. At the national level, I would like to highlight some examples that of what has been done here in Portugal, along with Tourism of Portugal and its Hospitality and Tourism Schools Network. The Portuguese government, aware that together we will overcome this um, troubled phase, has actively uh, contributed to the balance of the sector with some measures appropriate to the crisis caused by this pandemic, with life support financial measures, namely some credit lines for micro and small medium enterprises. But we have done more. The Portuguese schools of hospitality and tourism quickly implemented a set of extraordinary measures guaranteeing students online education and suspension of tuition fees to all students. We continue to invest in the training of the sector through online sessions such as, those, as the BEST program, BEST stands for Business Education for Smart Tourism. Um, this is a program dedicated to the most uh, varied topics, including digital and sustainability, of course. We also launched the online certified executive training program designed to support companies in identifying uh, concrete measures in each business area. 
To give you an idea of the numbers in 2020, we um, have managed to, in total, have managed to organize more than 700 training sessions involving pretty much 7,000-4,000 participants. These participants um, have been involved in these training sessions during the year of 2020. At the moment, the Digital Academy of Tourism of Portugal, uh, our national board of tourism, has more than 10,000 people enrolled who regularly participate in the training actions that are taking place. I would also like to highlight other initiatives. We are developing a questionnaire for the assessment of digital maturity. Our aim is to uh, identify uh, a gap or to develop a gap analysis of the current skills of professionals in light of what may be the future requirements of the sector and to identify um, and characterize the future training programs that we need to implement. By the end of January, we also um, intend to launch the best in-house training proje uh, project. This is an innovative project based on a training action, action methodology, which will bring companies uh, closer to its, uh, to its future employees, to its future workforce, and to these training programs. We also are developing with OCDE, OCDE um, a study regarding digital skills in the tourism sector. Within the scope of this, uh, this study, uh, OECD, uh, OECD is developing uh, these ma uh, this, uh, this matters. Portugal will be, will be targeted as a case study, which will allow us to have a data and information in all these subjects. And this study is uh, supposed to be uh, concluded by the ha first half of 2021, by the way. So, in conclusion, um, dear all, uh, we have a unique opportunity to recover and to rebuild the tourism ecosystem in Europe. Thus, even though triggered by such a dramatic crisis, we have a real opportunity now to reinvent the tourism sector of tomorrow. This is why uh, we at the Portuguese Presidents will organize on March the 1st an extraordinary meeting of European Ministers for Tourism on a virtual format. This meeting aims to obtain a follow-up of the tourism ecosystem situation and to prepare the spring-summer session. We all, Member States, Commission, European Parliament, international organisations, associations, business, academia, consumers, should work on the EU tourism agenda for the next decades, designed and, de designed and based on our common ground desires, focused on developing our economies and increasing our life quality. Our emphasis should be on sustainable recovery in its three pillars, including environmental, social and economic, which means that everyone involved in tourism, government, tour operators, service providers, transport operators, community service, NGOs, tourists, local governments, industrial associations, all of us can contribute to this recovery. This event was a real opportunity to discuss how we should design better skill and training policies within the tourism across Europe, preparing and boosting the supply side with a better and attractive offer for this after-pandemic consumer's demand. This is a good example of how the EU can play a real and effective role for the European enterprises to play a more competitive, resilient, social, greener and digital way of doing sustainable business in order to enhance the EU as a number one destination in the world and strengthen one of the most competitive economic sectors in the global context, tourism. É tempo de agir, as we say in Portuguese. In English, it's time to deliver and make change happen. Thank you all.